Introduction by the Author to a Defense of Idealism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. A Defense of Idealism by May Sinclair. Introduction by the Author there is a certain embarrassment in coming forward with an apology for idealistic monism at the present moment you cannot be quite sure whether you are putting in an appearance too late or much too early it does look like personal misfortune or perversity that when there are lots of other philosophies to choose from you should happen to hit on the one that has just had a tremendous innings and is now in process of being bowled out as long ago as the early nineties idealism was supposed to be dead and haunting oxford i know that the new realists have said that it is now a fashionable philosophy but either they do not really mean it or they mean that only philosophies in their last decrepitude become fashionable at all they mean that nineteenth-century monism is a pseudo-philosophy of the past and that twentieth-century pluralism is the living philosophy of the future it is possible to agree with this view without accepting the program of the pluralists i think it may be said that certain vulnerable forms of idealism are things of the past and that the new atomistic realism is a thing of the future at any rate of the immediate future but we know of old realisms that died and decayed and were buried and of new idealisms that died and rose again in india the sankhya philosophy of the many fought the vedanta philosophy of the one it can hardly be said to have driven its opponent from the field pragmatic humanism and vitalism are going from us in the flower you may say of their youth and they were robust philosophies m bergson even made philosophy the vogue in mayfair for a whole season and so i think that some day which may be as distant as you please the new realism will grow old and die and the new idealism will be born again it will be born not out of its own ashes nor out of its own life only but out of what is living in the system that for the time being has superseded it the drastic criticism of their opponents is what keeps robust philosophies alive and seeing the great part that idealism has played in the past i cannot think that to choose it if you have any choice in these matters is perversity it is however a personal misfortune when your choice causes you to differ almost with violence from those for whose accomplishment you have the profoundest admiration you cannot help feeling that it would be safer to share some splendid error with samuel butler and m bergson or with william james and mr bertrand russell if the uncompromising virtue of mr russell's logic left him any margin for error than to be right in disagreeing with any of them in samuel butler's case i feel no sort of certainty that on the one point where i have differed from him i am even approximately right his theory of personal identity is free from certain complications which are serious drawbacks to mine mine if tenable would solve the one serious difficulty of his it would also go far to support the argument for human immortality this however must tell against it rather than for it by suggesting an unscientific party pre panpsychism has an irresistible appeal to the emotions i like to think that my friend's baby made its charming eyelashes that my neighbor's hen designed her white frock of feathers and my cat his fine black coat of fur themselves because they wanted to instead of having to buy them as it were at some remote ontological bazaar but emotion doesn't blind me to the possibility that things may not after all have happened quite in this way and this is the only appeal of any sort that butler does make he is pure from the least taint of what mr bertrand russell quoting mr santayana calls maliciousness as for personal identity both his theory and mine are open to the objection that they are not theories of personal identity at all in this matter i feel as if i had used butler 
and perhaps abused him for my own purposes he has given me an inch and i have taken an l still i think my l was very fairly suggested by his inch discovering dilemmas in m bergson's philosophy is an enthralling occupation while you are about it but it leaves no solid satisfaction behind it does not as samuel butler would have said give you peace at the last when it is all over you feel as if it had not been quite worth while what do a few logical dilemmas more or less matter in the work of a poet and a seer i said just now that vitalism is a robust philosophy it is nothing of the sort it is subtle exquisite fragile to try to analyze it to break through that texture of beautiful imagination is to lay violent hands on the living palpitating thing that endures only on the condition that you do not handle it one other part at any rate of what i have written calls for some apology my criticism of pragmatism which is associated with an honoured name the monist who hates pragmatism and loves the pragmatist who let us say abhors william james's way of thinking and adores his way of writing who in the very moment of hostility remains the thrall of his charming personality and brilliant genius that monist is in no enviable case but what was i to do i believe the issue between pragmatism and idealism is vital i believe in pragmatism as a branch and a very important branch of casuistry i do not believe in it as a philosophy it is a method and not a philosophy it is not even a philosophic method pragmatism is one long argumentum ad hominem and it is nothing more now the argumentum ad hominem is all very well in its way but that way should be purely supplementary it is a perfectly fair and legitimate method when employed as an outside prop to the clean metaphysical arguments by which a clean metaphysical case must stand or fall anybody may use it for all it is worth provided he gives due notice and isolates it to guard against infection mr mcdougall for instance defends animism with a long array of arguments ad hominem but he uses them under protest as if he were a little bit ashamed of them and he is careful to keep them in the strict quarantine of a chapter to themselves pragmatism by its very nature knows nothing of these precautions it does not sterilize its instruments before it uses them it does not want to sterilize them it is courageous it courts rather than fears infection it must stand or fall by its appeal to the pragmatic instinct the business instinct in men or it would not be pragmatism and so i do not think that the pragmatist is always fair to his opponents i do not mean that he weakens their case by misstatement before he demolishes it far from it you might say that the mere statement of the monist's case was far safer in william james's hands than it is sometimes in his own i mean that the pragmatic method faithfully followed lands the pragmatist in misrepresentation not of his opponent's case but of his opponent's attitude to call monism the philosophy of the thin and pluralism the philosophy of the thick is fair enough controversial practice rationalists may not like it but they have brought it on themselves but would it have occurred to anybody but a pragmatist to preface a serious course of lectures on his subject with a classification of idealistic monists as tender-minded and of pluralists as tough-minded you might just as well call your opponent a fathead at once and have done with it it is deadly it is damning it is unforgettable such epithets stick and sting to all eternity they keep people off monism they must have prejudiced william james's audience against it from the start before he could get in any of his logic and that is precisely what it was designed to do what was that audience to think when it was told that the tender-minded are rationalistic intellectualistic idealistic optimistic religious free willist monistic and dogmatical and that the tough-minded are empiricist sensationalist materialistic pessimistic irreligious fatalistic pluralistic sceptical 
observe how pragmatism appropriates all the robust and heroic virtues and will not leave its opponent one of them think of the sheer terrorism of the performance could you wonder if covered with that six-shooter professor james's audience plumped for pragmatism before it had heard a single argument each member of it must have registered an inward vow tough-minded i'll be that but does the classification really hold are the virtues and vices justly apportioned nobody thinks of kant and hegel as nice comfortable philosophers whose bosoms they could lay their heads on the third book of hegel's logic is not exactly an education sentimentale and the triple dialectic is not regarded by anybody except pragmatists as suitable reading for the mentally deficient kant's pragmatism of which of course i shall be reminded was an afterthought which doesn't prevent pluralists from using him as a whipping-post when they want to the author of die welt als wille und vorstellung was not precisely one's idea of an optimist there are passages in dr mctaggart's studies in hegelian cosmology from which you gather that he is not inaccessible to human tenderness but with a toughness that no pragmatist has ever equalled he denies his absolute to be a person he has stripped it bare of everything that is comfortable and nice if it comes to that what about the pragmatist humanist god who is so tender-minded that he cannot be held responsible for pain and evil and collapses under the sheer emotional strain of his own universe the god of pantheism may have his brutal moments and his moments of unbending but his worst enemies can't say he isn't robust and there is no tenderness at all about mr bradley's principles of logic as for the mr bradley of appearance and reality if he has a fault it is that in the interests of his absolute he carries hard-headed hard-hearted thorough-paced scepticism to excess by no possible manipulation of phrases can you make it appear that mr bradley is even soft in places he is in fact a tough whom one would have thought few pragmatists would care to meet on a dark night mr bertrand russell is about the only living philosopher who can stand up to him and we have heard before now of dogmatic realism and after all is it so very certain that logical ideas are tender and that facts are hard can you find a fact that's harder more irreducible than the principle of contradiction or than any axiom of pure mathematics facts have a notorious habit of elusiveness and liquescence as for thinness is there anything more tenuous than matter apart from our sensations of so-called material qualities matter of which william james says that it is indeed infinitely and incredibly refined the physicist is he who deals in phantasms of thought invisible impalpable compared with which even mr mctaggart's absolute is a perfect falstaff it looks as if the only things that stand firm in this universe are ideas truth goodness beauty there is not a fact that bears their imprint and their image for long together yet they eternal and immutable remain the backbone of philosophy is logic pragmatism has no logic it is spineless idealism may have too much logic and may be too rigid but this surely is a fault on the side of hardness rather than of softness at any rate the method of philosophy should be purely logical the idealist does claim purity for his method and with some reason the method of the pragmatist is contaminated with its genial contact its joyous commerce with the metaphysically irrelevant pragmatism is an unsterilized philosophy i do not say it has not done good service in criticism that it has not reminded us of the existence of things that idealistic philosophers forgot but if it were passionately adopted consistently held and carried to its logical conclusions the eternal ideas of truth goodness and beauty would lose their meaning and we our belief in them luckily people are seldom logical and consistent and passionate in their adoption even of wrong methods in philosophy it is painful to differ from m bergson and from william james but it is dangerous to differ from mr bertrand russell if there is dismay just at present 
in the ranks of idealistic monism it must be mainly owing to his formidable methods of attack i hope there is dismay i should be very sorry for the idealistic monist who did not feel it his complacency would do more credit to his heart than to his head humanism pragmatism and vitalism have all gone for him but barring the shrewd thrust of william james they have gone with no particular flair for his special vulnerability and when touched he could always point to some wider chink in his opponent's armour the assaults of vitalism at any rate left his position practically intact but the realistic pluralism of mr bertrand russell of mr whitehead of mr alexander and the new realists is a very different thing for the logical structure of vitalism is faulty though you feel instinctively that m bergson has vision and that his vision is right with atomistic logic it is the other way about its structure is almost flawless though you may feel instinctively that its vision is not wrong but simply not there i do not think that even an atomistic logician would go so far as to maintain that instinctive feelings and algebraic logic have nothing to do with each other since feelings can be subjects of propositions but he would say and he would be perfectly justified in saying that if intellectual truth is your objective you must get your logic right first and settle it with your instincts and your feelings afterwards as best you may now atomistic realism gives no support to the belief in the beyond and very little encouragement if any to the hope of the hereafter and in this world there is an enormous number of people probably the majority of the human race whose instincts and feelings are passionately opposed to any theory which would deprive them of the belief in the beyond and of the hope of the hereafter many of them who would surrender the belief with composure still cling to the hope many would give up the hope if only they could be sure of the belief others again like william james are quite genuinely indifferent to the event the idea of life after death is even slightly disagreeable to them personally i do not share either the indifference or the repugnance but those who do not desire personal immortality for themselves may desire it for others who are dearer to them than themselves they cannot face with equanimity or indifference the thought of the everlasting extinction of these lives and many of them care for intellectual truth as passionately as they care for their hope and their belief and between those two passions the new philosophy draws a hard and fast line it says if you are out for truth you must play truth's game your feelings and your instincts must take their chance they must not be allowed to load the dice that is the gist of mr russell's austere and beautiful charge to the students of philosophy as it was plato's to follow the argument wherever it may lead to wait patiently when it puts on a veil there are passions and passions and it is to the passion for intellectual truth fiery and clean and strong that he makes his irresistible appeal there are still a great many people who think that the belief and the hope are more compatible with some form of idealistic monism than with realistic pluralism they think that if atomism is pushed to its logical conclusion there will be very little chance for god and immortality and i gather that realistic pluralists think so too is realistic pluralism really true if it is every hope and every belief that is incompatible with it must be given up but if it is not true if it is even doubtful it would be to say the least of it a pity that anybody should be lured from his belief and hope by its intellectual fascination i have tried to disentangle what is true in it from what i believe is merely fascinating i have tried to disentangle what is untrue in idealism from what i believe to be sound and enduring above all i have tried to disentangle in my own conclusions what is reasonable supposition from what is manifestly pure conjecture i have tried to state my adversary's case to the best advantage for him if i have failed in this it will have been through misunderstanding and not i hope through maliciousness some misunderstanding may have been inevitable 
in dealing with the purely mathematical side of Mr. Russell's argument, since mathematics are for me a difficult and unfamiliar country. It is here that I have every expectation of being worsted. In all this, it has been hard to free myself from the fascination of pluralism. When exercised by Mr. Russell, it is so great that almost he persuades me to be a pluralist. If I have not surrendered, it is for reasons which I have tried to make clear. There is one side of the new realism which is not directly touched in these essays, its ethics. This ground is covered by what has been said about its theory of concepts or universals, the platonic ideas. But I believe that ethics owe a greater debt to the new realism than to any philosophy that has been its forerunner in modern time if goodness and justice are not eternal realities irreducible and absolute moral sanction is a contradiction in terms there will be no ethical meaning and no content that distinguishes goodness from usefulness or pleasantness or justice from expediency the work of mr g e moore is a perfect exposure of the fallacies and sophistries of hedonism utilitarianism pragmatism and evolutionary ethics the clearest and strongest statement of the case for absolute ethics is to be found in his principia ethica and in mr bertrand russell's philosophic essays the reader must judge whether absolute ethics and the moral sanction are secure on a basis of spiritual monism or on the pluralistic theory of outside realities they will remember that a purely external sanction is no sanction at all the metaphysical basis is crucial in the ethical question it may be that it is too late to reconstruct what realism is destroying it is certainly too early to forecast the lines on which reconstruction will proceed and it would take a very considerable metaphysical genius to do it these essays therefore only suggest the possibility of the new idealism no doubt many people will find that my questions are out of all proportion to my conclusions and that the conclusions themselves are too inconclusive to these i cannot give any answer that would satisfy them others will object that my conclusions are out of all proportion to their grounds and that far too much has been taken for granted they will protest against the appearance of an essay on mysticism in a volume professing to deal seriously with serious problems they may even look on its inclusion as an outrageous loading of the dice to them i can only reply that that is why i have given to mysticism a place apart i agree that mystical metaphysics are an abomination but metaphysical mysticism is another matter i would remind my readers that some psychological questions were part of the program too that mysticism is of immense interest and importance in psychology and that i have criticized certain aspects of it as severely as its bitterest opponents could desire i am as much repelled by the sensuous variety of mysticism as i am attracted by its austere and metaphysical form i am as convinced as any alienist that its more abhorrent psychological extravagances are the hysterical resurgence of natural longings most unspiritually suppressed these exponents are worthy only of the pity we give to things suffering and diseased but there is another side even to what may be called the saint's tragedy there is a passion and a strain and a disturbance of the soul born of its struggle between religious dualism and its unconscious longing for the absolute and there is also a pure and beautiful mysticism that springs from the vision or the sense of the oneness of all things in god it knows nothing of passion's disturbance and its strain its saints are poets and its counterpart in philosophy is spiritual monism the fact that this sense has been evolved steadily and perceptibly from the primitive savage's sense of the supernatural is no ground for depreciating it you might as well depreciate the mathematical attainments of a pluralist philosopher on the grounds that they have been evolved from the primitive savages calculations with the fingers of one hand the question for students of comparative religion is not whether it is a survival 
for all life is a survival but whether its presence marks a reversion or a progression whether it is a sort of vermiform appendage or a form inspired with the secret of the life that was and is and is to be but i am painfully aware of the extreme uncertainty of my conclusions too if it had been possible to give them the form of questions without making a mess of my sentences i would have done so it would have shown perhaps a greater courtesy to the inscrutable in any case i do not want to be wholly identified with my imaginary monist who is so undaunted and cocksure under the horrible mauling he gets from vitalists and pragmatic humanists and pluralists he does not i am afraid always display the very best metaphysical temper though i think the pragmatic method a wrong method in philosophy i have used it in one section of my final chapter but i have followed mr mcdougall's good example in placing it where it could do no harm so many sources have been drawn on that but a small part if any part of this book can claim to be an original adventure the best of it is only a following of good examples where i have touched on general psychology i have invariably followed mr mcdougall as the best available authority but readers who are not familiar with his work should realize that he is not responsible for any theories i may have based on it and most likely he would not endorse them my thanks are especially due to my friends mrs stuart moore evelyn underhill who first introduced me to the classics of western mysticism and to whose work in this field i am more indebted than i can say and mr cecil de lisle burns who made me acquainted with the new realists and held continually before me the risks i ran in differing from them and to mrs susie s brierly for criticism relating to an important point in experimental psychology also to dr beatrice hinkle of cornell university for kindly allowing me to use her admirable rendering of the hymn i am the god atum which appears in her translation of dr jung's psychology of the unconscious and to the editor of the north american review for leave to reprint my article on the gitanjali of sir rabindranath tagore may sinclair london january twenty fifth nineteen seventeen end of author's introduction recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one section one of a defense of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the panpsychism of samuel butler section one the plain man is supposed by philosophers who are sure of nothing to be sure that whatever else he is or isn't he is himself he may or may not believe that he has a soul or that if he has one it is the least bit likely to be immortal but he is quite quite sure he has personal identity that he is not his own grandmother or his own son and certainly not one of those objectionable robinsons he may even flatter himself that he has what he calls individuality it is these happy certainties and this pride of the plain man that samuel butler shatters with his theory of panpsychism if he does not positively strip every one of us bare of those three things he maintains that so far as we can be sure to have them at all they are what we have least cause to be proud of as there certainly is a sense and a very distinct sense in which a man may be said to be his own grandmother and his own son if he has a son it may be worth while asking what we mean by individuality by personal identity and by a self it is sometimes assumed both by philosophers and plain men that when we talk about these three things we mean or ought to mean the same thing yet it is pretty evident that we don't and that we oughtn't to we say that a man has individuality if he has certain striking characteristics that mark him out from other men and though no doubt by individuality 
we mean something rather more subtle and intimate than say a boisterous manner or a taste for cubism or for remarkable and distinctive neckwear we are very far from knowing precisely what we do mean anyhow the term individuality would seem to stand not so much for personal identity as for the marks and signs of it and for something belonging to a self rather than for selfhood in the same way personal identity is not a term we can play ducks and drakes with it does i think imply something that either has identity or has it not that either is or isn't the same something wherever and whenever it appears to be and that something again would seem to be what we call a self but it is by no means certain that the something that we call a self exists it is indeed highly problematical and as the existence of the self happens to be the problem before us we must not assume it at the start the trouble is that we have got to make some attempt at a definition and that our definition must be wide enough to cover all the ground on which the problem has been previously debated for this purpose we are driven to assume most improperly that the terms self selfhood personality personal identity and individuality all stand for one and the same thing for the moment then i shall take the simplest of these terms self and define it as that which is present to all states of consciousness in any one conscious organism and even this is a hazardous definition still i can't think of any other that is more likely to satisfy any of the disputants without begging the question in dispute consider what a question it is for materialists the self is an illusory by-product of consciousness which is itself an illusory by-product of the physical processes of the organism and the world it lives in for idealists like mr bradley the self is one horn of the interesting dilemma which lands him in the absolute as his only refuge for idealists like dr mctaggart it is a fundamental though imperfect differentiation of the absolute a paradox that does not quite amount to a dilemma for pragmatic psychologists like william james it is individuality the bundle of its own characteristics so its appropriate place is quite clearly with the things that are not selves which is the other horn of mr bradley's dilemma again for psychologists intimidated by william james and anxious not to compromise themselves it is psychical disposition whatever that is souls were out of fashion when william james was lecturing at harvard but they are coming in again with the courageous psychology of mr mcdougall for whom a self is in plain honest language a soul for biology the self is the individual and the individual is the living organism for biologists like samuel butler so far as individuality is more than numerical identity it is the sum of the characteristics acquired consciously by the organism after its birth a contemptible sum compared with the vast capital it carries over from the experience of the race all that experience by which it has incredibly profited the individual keeps stored in his unconscious memory and draws upon for every occasion in his daily life his unconscious memory is thus a vast pantechnicon of knowledges and aptitudes that serve him far better than any that he can learn or cultivate on his own account according to samuel butler our unconscious life is the only life that is complete and perfect and worthy to be lived and he drives us to the conclusion that individuality is the most insecure of our possessions and that any way the individual does not greatly matter we should have had to leave it at that but for certain recent developments in the study of abnormal psychology psychoanalysis which is based on a minute and detailed observation of the same facts of unconscious memory suggests the opposite conclusion it is odd that the only light that has so far been shed on this dubious question should come from that region of profound murkiness this is not the place either for a defence or for a critique of psychoanalysis psychoanalysis is on its trial 
the result of the trial need not concern us psychoanalysts themselves appear to be divided into two camps their difference need not concern us for our purposes they do not amount to a row of pins for all psychoanalysts are agreed that the unconscious is a vast pantechnicon but a pantechnicon murky to the last degree and chock full of hideous and repulsive things but its murkiness need not concern us either granting for the moment that we know what we mean by the unconscious and that the unconscious is or can be a pantechnicon and that it is full to overflowing i see no reason why it should overflow with things hideous and repulsive any more than with beautiful and attractive things it seems fairly obvious that all sorts of things must have been put away there and that psychoanalysts have not laid their hands on all of them enough that both the psychoanalysts and samuel butler find the mainspring of evolution in the organism's will to live and to make live both assume that the life force is a psychic rather than a physical thing for our purposes it does not matter whether the new psychology of the psychoanalyst lays too much stress on the will to make live and too little on the will to live on both theories the will to live is indestructible it persists in the unconscious memory of the individual and through his unconscious memory the individual is one with the race psychically as well as physically but whereas samuel butler says our only sane and perfect life is the life we live unconsciously the whole theory and practice of psychoanalysis rests on the assumption that we only live sanely and perfectly so far as we live consciously so far as our psyche lifts itself up above its racial memories and maintains the life which is its own that is to say so far as we are individuals the secret of individuality lies in the sublimation to consciousness of the unconscious will to live to me this theory of sublimation is the one thing of interest and of value that professor freud and professor jung have contributed to psychology unfortunately the classic literature of the subject leaves this part of it a little vague the student is told all about psychoanalysis more indeed than he may care to know all the horrific contents of the pantechnicon are turned out for his inspection but it is left to his own ingenuity to discover precisely what sublimation is and how it works roughly speaking it is the diversion of the life force of the will to live from ways that serve the purposes and interests of species into ways that serve the purposes and interests of individuals roughly speaking all religion all morality all art all science all civilization are its work now it may be objected that unlike samuel butler the psychoanalyst is a specialist and a specialist in abnormal psychology at that and as his conclusions are drawn from minute and incessant observation of the behaviour of abnormal psyches they can be of no possible use to us we are not concerned with the eccentricities of neurotics and of moral lunatics but though we are not concerned with them they have a vital bearing on our problem all the same for the net result of the psychoanalyst's investigations can be summed up in three words neurosis is degeneration in this sphere every transgression is retrogression every perversion is reversion the neurotic or the morally insane person has turned back on the path by which he came he is the slave or the victim of his own unconscious memories and instincts of that forgotten yet undying past that preys upon the present and the future individuality on this theory is the outcome of a successful resistance to racial tendencies the normal grown-up individual has no longer any need to struggle against the forces that would drag him back and back to the life of the child the savage and the ape but the more individual he is the more he will resist the pull of the generation just behind him and all individuality the first time it appears is genius clearly this triumph of the individual would be impossible if the will to live were incapable of sublimation and if there were not more of it going as it were than what suffices for the needs of the species we have therefore to assume this incalculable amount 
over and above and this capacity for sublimation and here we are up against that bogey of the psychoanalyst repression at first sight it seems obvious that sublimation should involve repression the instincts of the primitive savage must be repressed in the interests of civilization the baby's sucking instincts must be repressed if the child is to be fed from cup and spoon adolescence must break the child's habit of dependence if it is ever to become manhood at any age there is a limit to the desires the individual can satisfy and the pursuits he can follow with success sooner or later a selection must be made and other things equal the beauty and worth of the individual will depend on the beauty and the worth of the interests he chooses for his own all sublimation is a turning and passing of desire from a less worthy or less fitting object to fix it on one more worthy or more fitting in the healthy individual there is no more danger in this turning and passing than in the transition from infantile baldness to a head of hair but for the neurotic every turning every passage bristles with conflict and disturbance he goes through crises that the normal individual never knows repression seems to be positively dangerous to him he cannot take even a little mild correction without it hurting him he cannot take anything like other people now the psychoanalysts tell you that wherever there is repression without sublimation there is a neurosis or psychosis it would be truer to say that wherever there is repression there is no sublimation and wherever there is sublimation there is no repression the will to live has found another outlet the indestructible desire another object and all is well for the happy normal individual desire is never repressed it is either directed and controlled or it wanders of its own accord into the paths of sublimation psychoanalysts out to vilify the unconscious have not paid sufficient attention to the facts of unconscious sublimation and all that they imply it is not quite clear whether with the neurotic every attempt at normal control issues in a repression most cases seem to point to some inhibition of the process of sublimation the neurotic is so ticklish that both righteous reproof and tender admonition may have this arresting tendency anyhow it seems pretty certain that whatever may cause it to occur genuine repression the damming up of every outlet for the will to live does really sooner or later set up some form of neurosis when this happens the repressed will to live the frustrated desire whatever it may be turn back again into the unconscious is stamped down there forsaken by the psyche and forgotten but it is not destroyed you cannot destroy what is indestructible cut off from the psyche's real life it sets up an unreal life of its own it lives again as all unaccomplished desires live in the dream world and in the haunted world below our waking consciousness there it plays its part disguised in fantastic and symbolic forms that have an ancient history for when professor freud began analyzing the dreams and waking fantasies of his patients he discovered that the persistent and recurrent symbols of the neurotic dream and the insane fantasy are the same symbols that we find persistent and recurrent in all primitive ritual and myth and folklore for instance in the dream which he defines as the disguised fulfilment of a repressed wish a serpent fire wood water a tree an arrow a sword an eagle a wheel a circle a cross a ram a lion a hat have the same symbolic meaning and are used with the same psychological intention of revelation and disguise as in the oldest rituals and mythologies wherever they appear they stand for the life force the will to live and to make live and their ritual intention represents man's primitive and incomplete effort at sublimation they are there in the unconscious just because they were there from the beginning the very fact that the repressed desire finds them there and arrays itself in them shows how far it has turned back along the path by which it came the psyche has forgotten these things and knows nothing but the will to live has been there before and remembers it knows its old playground and is at home on it and there it stays horribly forlornly enchanted 
beyond the reach of consciousness its vehicle a symbol its clothing a dream you see how dreadful it all is and how easily the cause of neurosis and of insanity might lie there in the cutting and casting off the miserable isolation and abandonment of the will to live its powerlessness to answer to the psyche's call if the neurotic cannot sublimate his will to live it is because his will to live has been turned back so far that all conscious links with it are broken if this is not psychoanalysis it is the purified spirit of psychoanalysis it is i believe the truth that underlies its theory the reality that underlies its practice is the breaking of the spell of forgetfulness the deliverance of the will to live from its bondage to the unconscious with its restoration to the psyche's conscious life sublimation becomes possible to it and with sublimation the individual comes again into his own in this healing process it is clear that we have to do not so much with the disclosure of a shameful secret as with the recovery of a lost will it does not look at first sight as if psychoanalysis had given us anything that amounts to very much only three conceptions more or less coherent a conception of the will to live valid as far as it goes but vague and bound up with a conception of the unconscious worse than vague because it betrays its inherent self-contradiction as soon as you begin to work with it a conception of sublimation by which this will to live perpetually transcends itself and is made manifest in higher and higher and more and more complex forms of life a process described in terms which sound morally satisfying and are still anything but clear a conception of the individual as a being of immense importance seeing that just those forces within and without him which arrest and retard his individuality are backward forces that the worst misfortune that can befall him is the backward turn that lands him in his own past and that the peculiar malignity of his worst maladies is that they rob him of his power to assert his qualities against the general characteristics of the race still this conception of individuality is something the individual at whatever stage we find him appears as the forerunner the master builder that superior swifter vehicle of the will to live which carries it forward and upward by virtue of his individuality he serves the higher functions of the will to live the plot thickens widens deepens and grows infinitely richer as the individual gets his hand in more and more we have there a perfectly valid and comparatively precise conception and yet it is only when we come to the individual and ask ourselves what we mean by individuality that our real troubles begin this conception of the individual that psychoanalysis gives us is bound up with our vague conception of the will to live which is itself bound up with a still vaguer conception of the unconscious and it is this conception of the unconscious which blocks the way until now here and elsewhere to avoid confusion i have followed my authors in using this term using it in any sense which happened to serve any purpose of the context at the time in slavish subservience i have spoken of instincts and desires symbolic meanings and ideas hidden away in our unconscious as if our unconscious were a cupboard or a cellar just now i spoke of stamping them down into the unconscious as if it were so much damp earth and of lifting them up out of it and carrying them into the conscious as if this operation were performed with a spade and wheelbarrow i even suggested and not so very figuratively either a going down into the unconscious to fetch back the will to live and all the time i was doing this it seemed to me that my authors and i were describing a perfectly credible performance it seemed to follow from the grounds and from the whole trend and purpose of psychoanalysis that the performance was credible and with each step the unconscious acquired more and more an almost discernible substance and a palpable power there it was underlying everybody's psychic processes and doing people quite innocent people all sorts of harm and if i did not speak of unconscious psychic processes it was more by good luck than good management now 
by the unconscious you may mean properly either things without consciousness such as chairs and tables and thunder and lightning or living things including ourselves in their moments of unconsciousness or a metaphysical reality conceived as unconscious the first sense was not contemplated in any of our contacts you cannot talk about stamping instincts and desires down into the inorganic and we should have had to be very sure of ourselves and the selves of other organic beings before adopting the second the third will appear later but we have no need for it yet so our real meaning emerges when we talk about unconscious psychic states and unconscious psychic processes we mean psychic states and processes of which we are not conscious it is owing to the limitations of the language that we are obliged to talk about the states as if they were or could be conscious or unconscious of themselves we have no business whatever to hand over our consciousness or unconsciousness to them we may have to go on talking about conscious and unconscious states for the sake of convenience in handling sentences but we should be very sure that we know what we are doing on the other hand we cannot talk about states of unconsciousness as if the term were interchangeable with states we are not conscious of for we have nothing immediately before us from moment to moment but the states of consciousness a state of unconsciousness may mean any condition of unawareness from profound sleep to mere forgetfulness or inattention to what is going on around me or ignorance say of what president wilson is going to do about the blockade or of what my neighbor is doing in his back yard a state of which we are not conscious is a state whose existence we infer from its results when we happen to be conscious of them such are our so-called inherited instincts the hidden complexes the hidden ideas meanings and associations revealed under hypnotic suggestion and psychoanalysis in all states of so-called unconscious cerebration end of part one section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one section two of a defense of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the panpsychism of samuel butler section two now at any moment i may wake from my sleep i may remember what i have forgotten my attention may be drawn to what is going on around me even my ignorance of what president wilson is going to do will cease when if ever he should finally make up his mind and with a little trouble i can inform myself of what my neighbor is doing in his back yard but of my states of unconscious cerebration i am never conscious and i may go all my life without being conscious of a single one of my inherited instincts or of those hidden things and the probability is that i shall in no circumstances ever be conscious of by far the greater number of them even of the things i merely do not attend to to say nothing of the million impressions that assail my sense organs every instant of which every instant i remain profoundly unaware the chances are that though they must be faithfully recorded somewhere i shall never be more conscious of them than i am now i am insisting on these distinctions familiar to every student of psychology because they help to clear up the original confusion and because we shall have to consider them very carefully later on for the moment then we must assume that the terms unconscious and unconsciousness stand for any or all of those psychic or psychophysical states of which we are not conscious and by the conscious and the consciousness we have been talking about we mean states of consciousness and nothing more otherwise we shall be begging the question of the existence and the nature of the ultimate principle we desire to re-establish later on we ought to mean this and we must mean it for whatever else we want to mean and intend ultimately to mean it is all that discrete psychology will allow us to mean at present unconsciousness or the unconscious then resolves itself into a negative abstraction but we must not forget that in our context its function was neither negative nor abstract 
it played a very positive and concrete psychological role and if we are asked whether in dismissing it we have anything half so good to put in its place we may say that states or processes of which we are not conscious will do extremely well and if we want to keep the old terms the unconscious or unconsciousness understood as a sort of convenient shorthand for these fuller and more precise terms we may or we can use them as equivalents for the sum of those processes and states as we have seen by far the most important part among them was taken by the will to live it is this will to live that we have conceived of as transferred and transformed or sublimated and as passing over from the unconscious to the conscious as if it belonged veritably and by its own nature to both worlds if it did it would be as good a bridge as any we have a right to ask for and it may prove to be all the bridge we are entitled to have but we found the greatest difficulty in representing to ourselves at all intelligibly its double role and as far as our conception of individuality and personal identity is bound up with this conception of the amphibious nature of the will to live it will be affected by its vagueness and confusion it may be that this is inevitable and that we cannot form any intelligible conception of either or of their relations to each other in which case we shall have to accept the problem as insoluble and put up with the vagueness and confusion let it be clear that this trouble is the old trouble carried a step farther and that the vagueness confusion and unintelligibility arise from nothing more or less than the intrusion of the unconscious with a big u into the region of the conscious with a big c as a matter of fact unconscious states states we are not conscious of always are intruding that is to say conditioning determining generally influencing and for all we know to the contrary actually causing conscious ones they can do this to the disturbance and the detriment of our individuality or perhaps a most disagreeable thought even of our personal identity now if it could be shown that there never was an unconscious psychic state that was not at some time or other a conscious one and may be at some time or other a conscious one again if it could be shown that all unconsciousness at least of what we call past states is simply a forgetting which is never final and complete if further it could be shown that what we call forgetting is never fortuitous or arbitrary is never even involuntary that we forget not because we must but because we will and for our own purposes and that we remember for the same reason remembrance being selection and selection an act of will and that both remembrance and forgetting serve the interests of our individuality and are part of the everlasting process of sublimation we shall be very much nearer the solution of our problem than we are now i confess that i should not have known where to turn for the precise evidence which will show this if it were not for the work of samuel butler the only thinker so far as i know except his predecessor professor ewald herring who has succeeded in making the subject of heredity thoroughly intelligible i might have said who has made it thoroughly amusing at the same time the undeserved neglect of butler's scientific work is probably owing to his incurable habit of being amusing not mildly and academically but startlingly recklessly extravagantly amusing throughout the entire course of a serious argument what was the scientific world of the seventies and eighties to think of a man who could dream of immortalizing his address on memory as a key to the phenomena of heredity under the title of clergymen and chickens it seemed to consider the man who couldn't control himself far enough to be serious over a serious subject like that was not to be taken seriously besides though butler could dissect clergymen very skilfully it was evident that he had never so much as skinned a chicken in his life so the scientific bigwigs of his day neglected butler and i am afraid that even at this time psychoanalysts who can talk about the polymorphous perverse and the father imago without the ghost of a smile will have no use for butler either still they ought to have for he has done more to make them intelligible than they have themselves i cannot help myself to as much of butler as i should like for i should get into trouble with the holders of his copyright 
so i must refer my readers if i am lucky enough to have any to the four books on evolution and heredity life and habit evolution old and new unconscious memory luck or cunning and all the passages in the notebooks of samuel butler which bear on those subjects and on individuality and personal identity and if in the end i accept butler's theory of heredity and reject his theory of individuality and personal identity it is for his own reasons and for others which i hope will be made clear first of all readers of butler must forgive me if i take them over ground already familiar to them first of all he starts with certain observations of experience actions which we once performed with difficulty and with attention with immense effort of will and intense consciousness such as playing an instrument writing reading talking and walking we now perform automatically and unconsciously and with the success increasing according to the extent of our practice that is to say according to the numbers of times those actions have been repeated the point of perfection being only reached when the action is performed unconsciously all these actions constantly repeated have become habits of our body still a certain amount of consciousness goes with the action of walking and a greater amount with the action of talking and so on while butler might have added continuance of all of them past the point of fatigue will bring us back to effort and consciousness again so that we can realize how great must have been the effort and how intense the consciousness they started with but the older actions and habits such as the beating of the heart breathing and digestion are unaccompanied by consciousness and effort or any memory of consciousness and effort and butler asks is it possible that our unconsciousness concerning our own performance of all these processes arises from over experience his entire theory of evolution is thus based on the simple truism that practice makes perfect when he finds an action performed with a supreme perfection a supreme unconsciousness he concludes not that these actions have always been unconscious but that ages of practice of effort that has been conscious have gone to the result he argues that we do these things so well only because we have done them before because in the persons of our parents and our ancestors we have practiced doing them for untold ages observe that butler regards the experience of our parents and our ancestors as our experience just as much and in as much as our bodies are our bodies because in short we know how to do them what is to know how to do a thing surely to do it what is proof that we know how to do a thing surely the fact that we can do it a man shows that he knows how to throw the boomerang by throwing the boomerang no amount of talking and of writing can get over this ipso facto that a baby breathes and makes its blood circulate it knows how to do so and the fact that it does not know its own knowledge is only proof of the perfection of that knowledge and of the vast number of past occasions on which it must have been exercised already and what holds good of the baby and its body after birth holds good before birth a baby therefore he says has known how to grow itself in the womb and has only done it because it wanted to on a balance of considerations in the same way as a man who goes into the city to buy great northern shares it is only unconscious of these operations because it has done them a very large number of times already a man may do a thing by a fluke once but to say that a fetus can perform so difficult an operation as the growth of a pair of eyes out of pure protoplasm without knowing how to do it and without having done it before is to contradict all human experience ipso facto that it does it it knows how to do it and ipso facto that it knows how to do it it has done it before and what holds good of the unborn baby holds good of the primordial germ plasm there is in every impregnate ovum a bona fide memory which carries it back not only to the time when it was last an impregnate ovum but to that earlier date when it was the very beginning of life at all which same creature it still is whether as man or ovum and hence imbued as far as time and circumstances allow with all its memories that neither the baby nor the germ consciously knows and remember any longer is what we might infer from the present ease and perfection of their performances we must be all aware he says of instances in which it is plain we must have remembered without being in the least degree conscious of remembering 
is it then absurd to suppose that our past existences have been repeated on such a vast number of occasions that the germ linked on to all preceding germs and by once having become part of their identity imbued with all their memories remembers too intensely to be conscious of remembering and works on with the same kind of unconsciousness with which we play or walk or read until something unfamiliar happens to us this something unfamiliar that happens to it being birth and when we look at the life of the grown-up individual and of the baby and of the germ as an unbroken series it is a singular coincidence that we are most conscious of and have most control over our distinctively human functions and that we are less conscious of and have less control over our pre-human functions and that we are least conscious of and have least control over those functions which belong even to our invertebrate ancestry in which our habits geologically speaking of extreme antiquity surely an utterly incomprehensible arrangement if we exclude consciousness and design from evolution perfectly comprehensible not to say inevitable if we admit them there are other facts in evolution which are perfectly explicable on butler's theory and utterly incomprehensible if we exclude desire and design and the continuity of consciousness in all organic beings such are the sterility of hybrids the instincts of neuter insects and to some extent the effects of use and disuse which fit into it without exactly calling for it his conclusion is not that memory and instinct are habit but that all habit and all instinct are memory that both are the result of practice that both unerring and perfect in adaptation as they have become presuppose knowledge and volition on the part of the individual that displays them and not as we are accustomed to imagine merely on the part of its ancestors that when we talk about inherited memory or inherited anything we have fallen into confused thinking and are using words without meaning that every reflex is a lapsed volition and all unconsciousness a lapsed consciousness that change and growth arise in fulfilment of a need a want a libido having at one time been brought about with consciousness with design and with volition that the individual inherits his own and not another's and therefore knows it again so perfectly that he is not conscious of it he himself the irreducible entity having been present in all experiences and in all memories we call racial or ancestral what is this talk he asks that is made about the experience of the race as though the experience of one man could profit another one who knows nothing about him if a man eats his dinner it nourishes him and not his neighbour if he learns a difficult art it is he that can do it and not his neighbour but when we come to ask how the individual has been present in the experiences of his ancestors and in what way his ancestors on this theory differ from him butler's answer though transparently clear is hard to reconcile with any conception of the importance of the individual not that there is the smallest confusion in his mind on this crucial point an impregnate ovum he says cannot without a violation of first principles be debarred from claiming personal identity with both his parents we ignore the offspring as forming part of the personality of the parent the law perceives the completeness of the present identity between father and son the continued existence of personal identity between parents and offspring but can a person be said to do a thing by force of habit or routine when it is his ancestors and not he that has done it hitherto not unless he and his ancestors are one and the same person it is also expressly stated that oneness of personality between parents and offspring is the first of the four main principles laid down in life and habit personal identity he says cannot be denied between parents and offspring without at the same time denying it as between the different ages and hence moments in the life of the individual on this showing the individual has but little that he can call his own it is not so much that the memories of his ancestors are platted in with his memories as that his memories all but the comparatively few and insignificant ones contributed by his experiences after birth are platted in with theirs to say that this is impossible because he has never appeared as an individual before birth 
is to beg the question of his appearance and his individuality it is clear that butler had no particular prejudice in favour of his own conclusion but that he was driven to it by an impartial survey of the facts we shall see later on that he was driven into the very last place where we should expect to find him the last place where he would have wished to be i repeat there is no confusion and no hesitation in butler's mind on this point we were our own parents and grandparents we were our entire pre-human ancestry even after birth we are little else besides and before birth we were nothing more he even regards the individual's life while yet in the bodies of his parents as superior to his life after birth because he considers that all perfect knowing is unconscious when we were yet unborn he says our thoughts kept the roadway decently enough then we were blessed we thought as every man thinks and held the same opinions as our fathers and mothers had done upon nearly every subject life was not an art and a very difficult art much too difficult to be acquired in a lifetime it was a science of which we were consummate masters and yet butler has just pointed out that unless we have maintained our own personal identity throughout the experiences of our forefathers those experiences will in no way profit us on his own showing this must be so equally on his showing it is difficult to see how it can be for throughout the entire argument the individual is identified with his own experiences after birth and with his own and his parents memories before their experience as individuals is presumably what he does not share all his embryonic experiences are vicarious and more vicarious his experiences further back at the same time he is said to have participated in these experiences the trouble is that when butler talks about a man's being identified with his parents he does not seem to have considered all that is implied in identification a is identical with b in this that b is identical with a if a man is identified with his grandfather his grandfather must be identified with him but according to butler identification is a lopsided affair in which a persists and b disappears while everything depended upon b's persistence so where by what chink does he come in and in what cranny does he lodge if the most that he can show for himself is this cellular prenatal existence in the bodies of his parents and his grandparents and of all his countless ancestors each of whom must have enjoyed precisely the same sort of existence in the bodies of their parents and ancestors we are still no nearer the secret of his being granted that he thus participated in each and all of their experiences in his primordial cellular way still the manner of his participation remains mysterious even if we assume as we perfectly well may a most extraordinary capacity for participation and for storage of experiences in the cell how are we to imagine participation practical and intelligent participation such as will enable him to perform creditably a series of complicated coordinated actions as soon as he is born without a participator butler's arguments are unanswerable we cannot explain or account for the most ordinary facts of our life and consciousness without presupposing that we have lived and been conscious before and yet there is not one of his unanswerable arguments that cannot be turned against his own conception of personal identity unless the individual carried through all his previous experiences some personal identity over and above that of his progenitors their experience will remain theirs and be no earthly good to him for he could not profit by it to the extent he has been proved to have profited if at every stage of his past career he had not been capable of absorbing and assimilating it of taking it to himself therefore he must have a self a continuous indestructible self distinct from his progenitors selves yet in direct communion with them to take it to it is precisely that self that personal identity over and above that butler denies to him and in denying it to him he denies it equally to each of his progenitors all along the line there is none to participate and none to profit grant him that self and the whole process of evolution and the whole problem of heredity are transparent as a pane of glass deny it and we are where we were in the dark days of darwinism but whereas darwin and wallace at least left us free to take what natural selection could not give us 
what butler's right hand gives us his left hand snatches from us again it is as if buffon and lamarck had opened a window on the dark side of our house looking towards our past and it is as if butler had found that window and cleaned it and made it bigger and called to us to look through and then in sheer perversity had closed and darkened it before we could look again and be sure of what we had seen end of part one section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one section three of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the panpsychism of samuel butler section three without a self over and above organism over and above memory the whole series of past memories and past experiences is unthinkable for we start with an individual even if we could conceive him maintaining his divided identity fairly well in the persons of his parents and perhaps of his grandparents what of the generations behind them what of his infinite division the scattering of him the indivisible throughout those geometrically increasing multitudes but even his pre-existences are not much more unthinkable than the poor and precarious existence which is all that butler allows him as an individual after birth for if it is not quite clear how he persisted in his parents and whether anything of him persisted over and above them at all there is no sort of doubt as to how his parents persist in him and in what ravaging and overwhelming proportion could there be a more shocking irony of fate than that butler who did more to destroy the prestige of parents than any writer before or after him who so abhorred the idea of parentage that he resisted the clamourings of the unborn rather than commit the cruelty of giving any child a father however much it might desire a father could there be a more shocking irony than that this great repudiator of parents this passionately original and individual soul should be driven by his own terrible logic to identify himself indistinguishably with his father and his mother and his grandfather and his grandmother and so on backwards with all his ancestors and that he should have regarded the life identified with theirs as infinitely richer and more important than anything that he could claim and call his own nor could he have answered that he only objected to parents as individuals for he has made it clear that he objected to them most emphatically as parents so that this plea would only impair his logic without diminishing the irony of his case now i think it can be shown that he was not really driven to this suicide but that it happened to him because he put the cart before the horse and attached personal identity to memory and memory to organism instead of attaching both to personal identity all the same as an account of the gathering together of memories and of the apparent miracles of psychic synthesis performed as a matter of course by every living organism as a view of evolution which makes every stage in its process transparent as a pane of glass butler's theory is perfect it is a clear vision of all life as one organism and of that organism as god that he could not allow god to be anything over and above an organism and was pained by the merest suggestion that he might possibly be more was the logical consequence of his refusal to admit that the self could be anything over and above its memories this consistency should not be charged too heavily against him nor can we hope to substitute anything clearer for that clear vision of his let us see whether we cannot keep it intact while adding to it the very factor that butler left out of the account the problem of the relation of psyche to organism would be comparatively simple if living beings descended from one parent it is obvious that we are following up not one thread but two threads each of which is soon lost in a multiplying network of threads and we must faithfully concede the self to be present in each and all of them if it is to gather together the experience which will enable it to burst on the world as an expert in psychic and biological behaviour could anything well be more unthinkable than a theory 
which compels us to this vision of selfhood maintained in such a multiplicity as that identity where all identity is lost were we not better off with the old simple idea of hereditary transmission which we had accepted before samuel butler came among us to disturb our peace well were we we have an idea a vague idea it is true but still an idea of the unity of individual consciousness of the holding together in one synthesis of a multiplicity of states and even this idea does little justice to the astounding complexity of that synthesis it is identity and multiplicity with a vengeance but we have no idea at all of how hereditary instincts are transmitted the physical theory of the transaction leaves the essence of the thing its psychic complexity untouched the idea that a complicated system of experiences can be handed over as it stands to a psyche innocent of all experiences and used by that psyche instantly with the virtuosity of an expert is about as thinkable as the idea that the central london telegraph and telephone system could be handed over to and successfully worked by a single operator ignorant of the first principles of telegraphy of the two i would back the operator you do not make it a bit more thinkable by regarding the heritage as accumulated by imperceptible increments from generation to generation since in the last resort the whole of it has to be handed over en bloc i said it would be simpler if living things were descended each from one parent and as it happens if we follow it far enough back the bewildering process simplifies itself since eventually we do trace them all to one supposing that we turn from our present and our future and set our faces backwards and imagine that network of the generations our generations spread out before us and streaming away from us to our past and that we hold the hither end of it by the single thread of self the network is broken in many places where individuals have remained single and left no issue and where whole families and species have dropped out but on the whole it is a comparatively continuous network if we could follow all the unbroken threads of all the meshes to their beginning on the farther end of the net we should find them all united again in one thread one single living being a being of extreme primordial simplicity but not simpler or more primordial than our own very complicated organism was when it began as a single germ plasm and thus the individual that we saw so scattered has become one again somewhere in some time and earthly place he and all the individuals he sprang from have existed in some relation to one simple indestructible primordial speck of protoplasm what is the nature of that relation only five relations are possible number one we may suppose that the speck of protoplasm produces the personality and in reproducing itself produces another personality and that reproduction of organism and production of personality go on till we come to reproduction through the union of two primordial cells which so far from altering the essential nature of the process only knits it tighter this process of reproduction which is what actually happens on the physical side on the part of the organism is on the psychic side unthinkable because open to all the objections which have been brought against the theory of transmission that is to say a personality which has been produced brand new with each organism by each organism has ipso facto been absent from the past experiences it is supposed to profit by to say nothing of the enormous difficulty of conceiving the production of a psyche a consciousness from a speck of protoplasm by a speck of protoplasm a difficulty which will meet us again number two or we may suppose that all the innumerable personalities that have been and shall be are present somehow with or in that one original speck of protoplasm and are simply transplanted with or into succeeding specks of protoplasm as they multiply and are developed with the development of the organisms this theory would account all right for the sharing of the experiences but it may be dismissed as putting rather too great a strain on one small speck of protoplasm number three we may suppose that the burden of reproducing its own kind is borne by the self 
and that it takes an even share in the labour of a psychophysical association each self looking after its own future development the business of the protoplasm being limited to producing more protoplasm and building itself up into organic forms this theory ignores the influence of the organism through which the self gains its experiences and therewith its development and the influence of the self by which the organism is built into just such forms as are adapted to the needs and the ends of the self we are not helped by any theory of the mere production of self by self for again unless some portion of the original self endures in the selves it produces it cannot impart to them its own experience or benefit by theirs and unless the selves again have been present with it in all its past experience they cannot share and benefit by it number four let us suppose then that the greater strain which is after all a purely metaphysical one is borne by this hypothetical self that the self and not the protoplasm contains within itself all selves that are and shall be and that the relation of the self to the original speck of protoplasm and to all succeeding organisms throughout all generations is that of the association of an undivided unapparent being with the means of its division and appearances we have here a much more workable conception of the self inasmuch as our difficulties are shifted to the metaphysical sphere where anything may happen some awkward things are bound to happen to an unapparent metaphysical being when once for all it makes up its mind to appear still they need not be too awkward on this theory the integrity of the original self must suffer severely if it does not endure throughout all its multiplied experiences that is to say if it is lost in the multiplicity of selves and the integrity of the selves suffers if they are lost in it either then there is no such thing as the integrity of the self or number five each self is something over and above all other selves over and above its own organism and all organisms in which it has had part over and above its own experiences and memories gained through association with all the organisms until they are actually born as individuals the selves will be members of many groups associated through the organisms they share in such sort that the experience and the resulting benefits are mutual neither experience nor benefit being obtainable unless we presuppose in each self a personal identity over and above all other selves in its own organism on this hypothesis which i believe to be the one in strictest accordance with the theory of panpsychism the relation of self to organism will by no means be the simple affair of one self one organism but will stand somewhat thus at one end of the scale entire ownership of the first speck of protoplasm which it finds itself associated with in the sense of one self one organism at the other end of the scale practically entire ownership of the organism it is born with as an individual in between starting from below upwards half ownership of two specks of protoplasm supposing the original speck to have split up into two and to have taken up with two other selves ownership of one-fourth of each member of the next two pairs similarly formed ownership of one-eighth in the four succeeding pairs and of one-sixteenth in the next subdivision and so on till his share diminishes to a thousand millionth part say in a thousand million organisms but always through all his thousand million incarnations his thousand million shares in other people's undertakings though his experiences are scattered and subdivided he is never lost he is only lost if with samuel butler we insist on identifying him with his business and his innumerable partners in the business and ignoring his constant and indestructible presence he is only scattered and divided if we think of him not in his own metaphysical or for the matter of that metapsychical terms but in terms of protoplasm you might just as well think of him in terms of the color that would indicate his presence in a diagram as for his infinitesimal share it is decidedly better from his point of view to hold an infinitesimal share in an infinitely great undertaking than to be entire owner of one speck of protoplasm as we have seen the most awful consequences for the individual follow 
if we hold the theory of heredity precisely as samuel butler held it i do not see how they are to be avoided as long as we persist in identifying the self with its memories and with the organism by means of which it acquires them on the other hand it must be admitted that the difficulties of the hypothesis of independent selfhood are great but i do not believe them to be insuperable if we bear in mind that selfhood is not necessarily interchangeable with individuality or numerical personal identity in the sense of one inhabitant of one body in that sense an individual is not an individual until he is born and in any case our bodies may very likely have more psychic inhabitants than ourselves it may be objected that on this view of the self the origin of its own and of all succeeding organisms looks a bit inadequate but if its own original and indestructible germ-plasm was as it certainly seems to have been a sufficient organism to begin with for a self that is drawn together innumerable past memories why should not the original speck of protoplasm be an organism sufficient to begin with for a self that harbours innumerable future possibilities if we conceive of the organism as nothing more or less essential to the self than its means of appearing or of manifesting itself we do greatly simplify the problem of their relation that everlasting subject of contention for biologists and psychologists and philosophers let us think then of the self's relation to its organism as the seeking finding possession and more and more perfect use of a means to manifestation obviously it can only manifest itself through its behaviour and its experiences instantly then it begins to behave and to experience even at this very earliest point in its extraordinary career it knows how to behave and to experience the first experience of any account that comes to it is when it finds that the original speck of protoplasm sufficient for a start is absurdly insufficient to carry on with if we like we may imagine that other selves baffled by this insufficiency have given up their protoplasms in disgust but that our self is more patient and more adventurous so in obedience to its inner urging the speck of protoplasm grows but still this humble self-contained existence cannot satisfy its unquenchable longing to appear and so it compels its organism to reproduce itself and the first scattering begins only by scattering by incessant subdivision can it acquire sufficient experience and sufficient practice and behaviour to fit it for the life it is to lead the really personable appearance it is ultimately to present when the self has acquired enough animal experiences and enough practice in animal behaviour and an organism so obedient to animal promptings that it can be trusted to run itself without perpetual interference from higher authority then and not till then it becomes human literally we can only do our work as men because as samuel butler has shown we have done all the animal part of it for ourselves so efficiently in the past just imagine how we should get on if before we could cook our dinner and while we were eating it we had to give our personal attention to each one of our visceral functions separately if in order to digest we had to superintend our digestion or in order to breathe we had to superintend our breathing or if in order to fight we had to see to the working of each separate unit of the fighting machine which is our body or if in order to write a poem i do not want to labour my instances but the case of the poem writer has points of special psychological importance if in order to write a poem we had to superintend each separate operation of our hand each separate operation of our brain to turn back on our path in time to recover all our meanings to travel in space to find and capture the loveliness we know we can understand the why and wherefore of the process of our evolution when we reflect that all the selves that we have ever been that we have put under us in the successive stages of our ascension are working for us now clearing up all the troublesome and boresome jobs we are tired of and so repudiate and leaving us free from our own affairs the work of the proud individuality we now are whatever he may have been and is the scattered one does not and cannot appear as a complete and full-blown individual until he has made up his mind once for all to gather himself together and be born and this presumably is precisely what he has done 
therefore throughout all the generations he has existed as want striving desire will to live to burst forth and be born if we were puzzled about the striving of the one to become many what about this striving of the many to become one end of part one chapter one section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one section four of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the panpsychism of samuel butler section four chapter two the question now arises what of his immortality is this outcome of his supreme effort his one and only appearance as an individual does he scatter himself again in his descendants and find his immortality only in them has he come to nothing if he leaves no descendants now on butler's theory which identifies the individual with his own organism and his own parents he has no immortality of his own only a scattered and vicarious life after death in the persons of his descendants if he has any only a subjective immortality in the memory of posterity if he has had sufficient forcefulness to impress posterity in fact on butler's theory his chances of existing as an individual in the first place of ever being born at all depend on circumstances over which he has no control for all butler's belief that it is the clamouring of the unborn that is responsible for each individual existence so that the entire culpability of the enterprise rests with the unborn and no child has a right to blame its parents if the enterprise should turn out badly still as the potential parent can and frequently does turn a deaf ear to the clamouring the actual decision rests with him and his refusal or the mere accident of his death even if he is well intentioned dooms untold millions of personalities to extinction the individual then has but one chance of existence to several million chances of extinction and he has no possible prospect of any immortality that counts and if we narrow him down to his bare achievements as an individual the small experience he acquires for himself in his short lifetime compared with his immense accumulations in the persons of his progenitors doesn't really amount to a row of pins so that existence itself when it does happen to him hardly seems worth the trouble of being born why all those tremendous labours of the generations for such a poor result why all those strivings and longings to be made manifest for such a pitiful appearance at the end if you say it is all for the race and not for the individual and that the individual only exists in and for the race that doesn't make the affair a bit more intelligible or a bit better in fact it makes it worse for we are sacrificing a reality a poor perishing reality but still a reality for as long as it lasts to an abstraction for what is the race but an abstraction if it is not the sum of the individuals that compose it and for the matter of that races themselves are doomed ultimately to extinction it may be so and if it is so we must bear it for we cannot help it but we are only driven to the conclusion that it is so if we accept butler's view of personal identity or the view of all those persons who on this point at any rate are agreed to agree with him if it can be shown in the first place that the achievements of the individual are not quite so insignificant as has been made out and in the second place that so far from personal identity being dependent on memory and ultimately on organism memory and organism ultimately are dependent on personal identity to the extent that not the simplest fact of consciousness and not the simplest operation of building up a primordial germ cell is possible without the presupposition of personal identity if further there is even the ghost of a reason for inferring in the absence of any other assignable cause that the mysterious thing we call personality behaves as we know causes do and can behave then though immortality will not follow as an absolutely certain conclusion how could it 
there will at least be a very strong presumption in its favour whether there will be evidence to satisfy the authority whom butler called any reasonable person is another thing people show their reasonableness in such different ways even from the foregoing brief review of the latest findings of psychoanalysis it must have been obvious that they are the corollary of the conclusion samuel butler drew from the processes of evolution it is not necessary to go over all that old ground again in order to point out the correlations the reader cannot have failed to identify that need or want which butler traces for us as the spring of all evolution with the will to live the libido which the psychoanalysts have traced for us as the source of all life and the spring of sublimation only when it comes to the relative value of racial and individual qualities of unconscious and of conscious being do the psychoanalysts part company with samuel butler first of all then if they did not openly declare the supreme importance of the individual they showed us that his grown-up individuality be its quality what it may is a far more highly sublimated thing than the bundle of racial functions and qualities he inherits to say that i am inferior to my own grandmother as i very well may be simply means that my grandmother was a superior individual that is to say that the functions and qualities that distinguished her from her progenitors had a higher sublimative value than the functions and qualities that distinguish me not that the functions and qualities she in common with all my other ancestors bequeathed to me are more highly sublimated than mine yet wretched individual that i am coarse where she was fine most stupid where she was most intelligent ungraceful and unlovely where she was all grace and all beauty still by the one fact that i refuse to be submerged by my racial qualities and functions that i lifted my head above the generations and added another living being another desire another will another experience to the sum of human experiences by the mere fact that after all here i am playing my part and not any of their parts i prove the superiority as far as it goes of my sublimation besides if it comes to that who is to say whether these undesired and undesirable traits of mine are really mine and not part of my inheritance it is when i fall short of my part when i return on my path and go back to them or when i simply refuse to grow up and persist in being a child and not a very enterprising or intelligent or original child at that it is when in four words i resign my individuality that i become inferior and the one word for it is degeneration to be degenerate is to fail to add the priceless gift of individuality to the achievement of the race therefore it seems an inappropriate word to apply to those very considerable individuals who have given their priceless gift in the form of genius however far they may have fallen short of the ethics of the family and the crowd and supposing this falling short to be a more frequent attribute of true genius than it actually is we may suppose that this failure in one direction is the price they have to pay for their supremacy in another and posterity that benefits by their loss should be the last to remember it against them as a matter of fact in spite of the efforts of biographers to fix it firmly in its mind posterity very seldom does remember it at all and if it comes to that what debt can the individual owe to the race that is greater than the debt the race owes to the individual what after all was the origin of our much valued much talked about racial characteristics the instinct of self-sublimation the desire and subsequent effort of certain enterprising individuals to outdo themselves to be something that they are not yet something however small that their progenitors were not think of the enterprise compared with foregoing enterprises the daring originality of the creature that first improvised a stomach because it wanted one can you deny an individuality and all things considered a very startling individuality to that creature and to go back to our much valued much talked about and possibly overrated progenitors every single one of them was an individual once and his value for posterity was chiefly his individuality
if he only showed it in the choice he made of one female rather than another for his mate individuals in their successive and successful sublimations raise the primordial will to live from the level of mere need and want through the stages of desire to those supreme expressions of individuality love and will there is too much talk about the race the race is nothing but the sum of the individuals that compose and have composed it and will compose it not only so but without the individuality the very marked and eccentric individuality of individuals races and the race itself would not exist it is the outstanding individuals the sports that have been the pioneers of evolution they have enriched and raised the species by compelling it to adopt their characteristics and yet it looks as if in the welter of unconscious and subconscious memories and instincts the individual had little if anything that he could call his own he is dwarfed to utter insignificance by the immensity of his ancestral heritage but i do not think we have to choose between the views of the comparative value of the individual and the race and the comparative amounts of their respective debts to each other for we cannot separate them our problem is more fundamental we have to choose between a difficult i admit it is a very difficult theory of the continuous identity of one self in many organisms associated for a while with the equally continuous identity of many selves to one organism and a self-contradictory theory which insists on continuous memory as the clue to the mystery of the individual's past evolution and yet regards him as a momentary insignificant spark of consciousness struck out from the impact of the masses of rolled-up unconscious memories each individual in the series of generations that come together to form the masses being himself such a momentary insignificant spark at this rate continuous consciousness that is to say continuous memory vanishes from the whole performance between difficulty and self-contradiction there can be only one choice the alternative to the spark theory is not handicapped by any inherent contradiction the individual's heritage is his if we allow him not only that sense of need which lamarck and buffon allowed him and that little dose of judgment and reason which huber claimed for his insects and samuel butler claimed for all organisms but a little dose of selfhood over and above his sense of need over and above reason and judgment over and above memory the individual is not his heritage his heritage is his it is the stuff he works with and sublimates and transforms it is the ladder he has raised himself by the territory he has conquered or it is nothing there is of course that alternative can we justify our assumption that selfhood is over and above now there is a very strong consensus of opinion among psychologists and mental philosophers that personal identity does depend and depend absolutely upon memory so strong that i have considerable qualms about putting forth any opinion that runs counter to that consensus it is strongest among those who like mr william james m bergson and mr mcdougall by no means regard mind as entirely dependent on its physical basis it is upheld by arguments that appear at first sight to be unanswerable and that on no theory should be lightly set aside so far i have been going all along on the assumption that we conceive personal identity as something which whatever its ultimate nature may be holds consciousness together we must not assume the thing we have got to prove so we cannot take for granted that what we call personal identity amounts to anything we can think of as a substance or a self or a soul or as a being in any way separate from and independent of consciousness for all we know it may be no more than the relation of each conscious state to another and to the whole we take the term as equivalent to the unity of consciousness consciousness certainly appears to be a unity whether there be a self to make it one or no we have nothing immediately before us but states of consciousness yet they appear to arrive in a certain order and to hang together with a certain cohesion of their own describe consciousness in terms deliberately chosen so as to exclude the personality we must not take for granted say that its states are only fortuitously associated 
still association involves perhaps i ought to say constitutes a certain unity say that consciousness is nothing but a stream and that though it appears to have islands in it the islands are really only part of the stream still the stream would not be a stream if it had not a certain unity it must be borne in mind that for all we are justified in saying about it beforehand this unity may be nothing more than the relation of states of consciousness among themselves but when we have reduced consciousness to the simplest the least assuming terms we have still this unity to reckon with even if the dream of professor huxley came true and the mechanical equivalent of consciousness were found to-morrow even if consciousness were proved to be nothing but a strange illusory by-product of the brain the queer spectral illusion of its unity would still confront us and here is my opponent's main argument how on any theory of consciousness could these appearances be kept up without memory if as impressions supervened on impression to take consciousness at its lowest each were instantly effaced if we forgot our states of consciousness i mean if consciousness forgot its states as fast as they occurred that is to say if consciousness kept on continually forgetting itself if there were no sort of even illusory registration anywhere what becomes of even that illusory unity and what on earth becomes of personal identity supposing there was such a thing anyway if we could never remember anything that happened to us we might just as well not exist at all for we should never be conscious of our existence personal identity may or may not be provable but without memory it is unthinkable i hope the adherence of memory as the presupposition of personal identity will not find fault with this way of putting it i do not think it is an unfair statement of their position i do not want to weaken their position in order to have the poor pleasure of demolishing it it is not at all easy to demolish and perhaps it is i and not they who are responsible for the only palpable flaw in it the ultimate argument ad hominem for it is clear that we might exist without being in the least aware of our existence in fact that is the way most of us do exist it may even be the only terms on which it is possible for us to exist at all i think there is something in the point but let it pass let the case stand without it personal identity may or may not be provable without memory it is unthinkable but is it it may be that neither is possible or at any rate actual without the other but thinkable if you can prove the existence of personal identity of a self a soul a principle call it what you like that is conscious but is not consciousness that is inseparably present to all its states of consciousness and identifiable with none of them unless it be with the act of will i will undertake to think it you say you can only prove it from consciousness that is to say from memory perhaps very likely but that is only saying that it is dependent on memory for its consciousness its mode of existence not that it is dependent on memory for existence itself we have just seen how samuel butler landed himself in the very bosom of the progenitors he abhorred as well as in a certain amount of self-contradiction just because he would insist on identifying personality with memory even the plain man to whose common sense he was always appealing could have told him better than that for the plain man does not place his identity in the fact that such and such things happen to him at such and such a date but that at such and such a date they happen to him to such and such a person the whole point and poignancy of their happening and of his remembering them is that they happened to him and not to another and that he and not another remembered them the plain man very properly assumes that he has a self that he personally was present at such and such dates that he is personally present to each state of consciousness as it arises and to the piling up of each state on another and to the whole if you choose to say that he himself is only another bit of consciousness added to the pile that the affirmation of self-consciousness comes forever and from moment to moment to the top that is a theory like another but i do not think it is a very good theory because it overlooks the fact that he was at the bottom too and went through all the layers and most certainly the plain man would have none of it but let us say that personal identity presupposes memory and is dependent on it then it follows rigorously that whenever we forget our personal identity ceases 
it goes out for long hours together in deep sleep when we have no memory and no consciousness at all and it comes to life again with the return of consciousness and memory i am afraid i do not see anything in the theory of its independent existence half so unthinkable as the recurrent miracle of its death and resurrection let alone the inconvenience of not knowing whether it is we who have come back and not somebody else if you say we do know because the revived memories are the same and that we have no other means of knowing the answer is that in the first place we do not know that they are the same and in the second place that they are not the same for even in continuous memory all we get is a succession and a synthesis of states a memory of a memory and identity of them there is none sleep has so divided today's unity of consciousness from yesterday's that to talk about identity of states is absurd so it looks as if memory and unity of consciousness so far from constituting personal identity depended abjectedly upon it and are we so very sure that personal identity is unthinkable without memory i do not mean merely inconceivable or unimaginable i suppose for that matter we can conceive or imagine or present to ourselves any state of consciousness as existing independently of any other or the whole of consciousness as existing without anything to hold it together in fact it is in this self-sufficiency that consciousness does present itself immediately and before reflection by ruling out all presuppositions of thinking we may and do conceive it so and many philosophers have refused to conceive it otherwise in the end it must be shown that personal identity is more than a presupposition of our thinking if we are to avoid the fallacy of concluding that what is first in thought is necessarily first in existence it must be what kant called a voraussetzung der erfahrung a presupposition of experience something without which experience would not be what it is or what it appears to be but for the moment let us suppose that personal identity is unthinkable without memory with what memories or memory did our conscious life then begin say that it started with unconscious memory the heritage well and good but for consciousness that is the same thing as starting with no memory at all to all intents and purposes i or if you prefer it my conscious states start with an absolute blank behind as well as before them in this case it will be truly my body that remembers and not i or they and though its memories will affect very profoundly my conscious states when they do arise out of the blank for me or for consciousness they do not exist nor can they exist on the theory of unconscious memory or on any theory that precludes personal identity that is to say the existence of a self before memory we saw that the heritage itself the instinct the knowledge made perfect through long ages of practice all that we have learned to call unconscious memory is meaningless unless it has once been conscious and would be utterly useless to us if it were not our memory we saw that is to say that our past consciousness likewise presupposes personal identity a self i admit that the argument from forgotten memory cuts both ways but when we consider that our conscious life the life of each individual in the series began with a forgetting and that in order to know perfectly we must know how to forget perfectly it looks as if the argument that presupposes memory has if anything the more dangerous edge and if to avoid both edges we turn for safety to the obvious alternative that memory and selfhood or that memory and consciousness are neither afore nor after another but simultaneous and mutually dependent consciousness becoming memory before we are conscious of it we are faced again with the annihilating fact of forgetting all these dangers and dilemmas are avoided if we do but put selfhood where the plain man puts it and where our everyday thinking puts it first end of part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two section one of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two vitalism section one i shall be reminded that dangers and dilemmas would be avoided much more easily and surely 
if we would only consent to put memory where the physiologist puts it in the brain cells of the organism and leave it there this would certainly be one way out if memory were really that simple affair of neural association fixed into habit which the physiologist takes it to be but does not memory presuppose two things which are not simple space and time time for the order of events in memory space for their juxtaposition it is not easy to see how any set of neural associations could yield either whether as presuppositions or as forms of arrangement schemata they stand as it were between memory and that hypothetical self removing memory a stage farther yet from its supreme place as the first memory itself is so dependent on them that we can make no valid statement about it that does not take them into account and it will be no use trying to show that personal identity is independent of memory unless we can show also that it is independent of space and time and space and time draw with a large net the view that m bergson has set forth in sur le donné immédiat de la conscience and la matière et la mémoire does more to make clear the relations of time space and memory than perhaps any philosophy before the day of vitalism this clearness is not altogether due to m bergson's metaphysical theory for as we shall see that theory lands him in many hopeless contradictions by the way but his view of time and space does not stand or fall with his theory of the elan vital and whatever the ultimate destiny of vitalism may be no metaphysic that comes after it can afford to ignore m bergson's really very singular view it is mainly owing to its author's brilliant and reckless inconsequence that monism can suck advantage out of it m bergson makes things apparently easy for himself at the start by letting the work of the mere intellect in his own phrase filter through and plunging into the thick of immediate consciousness in order to preserve its integrity he has to break with all past conceptions of time as quantity discontinuous infinitely divisible but as this idea of time as discontinuous divisible quantity has an awkward way of cropping up in spite of him he distinguishes between pure time durée, and as you might say popular or spurious time pure time or durée is intensive and neither divisible nor measurable that is to say it is not quantitative but qualitative for time is pure succession and never simultaneity simultaneity is juxtaposition and juxtaposition is a spatial thing time thus conceived is a bastard conception due to the intrusion of the idea of space into the domain of pure consciousness space in which all juxtapositions occur and no successions is purely quantitative discontinuous and divisible and this bastard time of which clock time is the glaring example takes on all the quantitative characteristics of space past present and future the time we divide into moments days and years is quantitative is spatial in pure time there is no past present and future only durée the past which bites into the present the present that bites into the future there are no interstices in time let us take it at that and see what happens you can never say of pure time that so much of it has passed an hour a minute or a second this is the spurious time which is really spatial measured by the shadow on the dial the sand in the hour-glass the hands on the clock moreover shadow and sand grains and hands move and movement is in space this is plausible and we shall presently see why it must follow that if i beat time tum tumpty tum tum tumpty tumpty tum i am really beating space for though a tumpty is equal to a tum their equality is of space and not of time for all the time they take there is no difference between one hundred and twenty-five tumpties and one tum seeing that there are no interstices in time's tum where its tumpties could creep in in fact time is taken by m bergson as a convenient stuffing for the interstices of space and since time is pure succession and not simultaneity 
no two events can happen in the same pure time and there is no time left for them to happen in but that impure time which is really space so that every minute dies a man every minute one is born can only mean that the death and the birth occupy the same space which is precisely what they are not doing and cannot do then there is pure space which is quantitative measurable infinitely divisible space is responsible for the awkward interstices we do not find in time and though we think of space as divisible we perceive it as extended that is to say continuous according to m bergson in pure perception immediate consciousness all contradictions are solved and all difficulties overcome let us say then that we do actually perceive space or at any rate objects in space as extended it is in space and space alone that objects can lie peaceably side by side but i am afraid it follows that they cannot succeed each other for succession is of pure time therefore there can be no movement the movements of molecules in bodies and of atoms and of electrons in ether or wherever it is they do move the course of the stars in heaven and the long succession of motor buses and vans and taxis on earth in the strand is occurring not in the strand and certainly not in pure space but where the long succession of my thoughts is occurring in pure time you see what has happened under m bergson's skilful manipulation space and time have simply changed roles for if quantitative time in which events are simultaneous is an impure and spurious time that is really space you may as well say that continuous space in which objects succeed each other is an impure and spurious space that is really time again m bergson's pure time is durée continuous duration but surely duration and succession contradict each other every bit as much as extension and divisibility i do not think that m bergson can be allowed more than anybody else to have it both ways but his contention is that in action and immediate perception which is based on action and on action only you do as a matter of fact get it both ways you have got it both ways before you have time to go back on the performance and see what you have got and how you have got it it is a performance that sets at naught all mathematical laws of space and time and motion that takes no account of the behaviour of hypothetical electrons in a hypothetical medium m bergson gives a reality to sensible space and sensible movement which he denies to mathematical space consequently he has no difficulty in assuming real movement he argues that because differences of sensation depend on differences of movement and because differences of sensation are intensive and qualitative and absolute are of kind and not of quantity or degree therefore movement is absolute in vain we try to base the reality of movement on a cause distinct from it analysis always leads us back to movement itself and this whether you watch the movements of objects in external space or are conscious of your own movements in muscular sensation i touch the reality of movement when it appears to me within me as a change of state or of quality exactly as in my other sensations which are obviously qualitative sound differs absolutely from silence as also does one sound from another sound between light and darkness between colours between shades the difference is absolute the passage from one to the other is also absolutely real i hold then the two extremities of the chain muscular sensations in me the sensible qualities of matter outside me and neither in one case nor the other do i seize movement if movement there be as a simple relation it is an absolute between these two extremities m bergson finds the movements of external bodies properly so called and you would have thought that these bodies and their movements would have given him pause but no some objects move others remain stationary how he asks can we distinguish between them how can we distinguish between real and apparent movement here these questions he leaves unanswered they are beside the point the question is not how changes of position in the parts of matter are accomplished 
but how a change of aspect is accomplished in the whole you see what has happened m bergson has shifted the terms of the problem from movement and immobility that is to say from that change of position which is the very essence of the question raised to change of aspect of the whole which was not in question if you accept change of aspect of the whole as the equivalent to change of position of the parts you have committed yourself without further argument to the proposition that movement of objects in space is on all fours with my sensations of movement it is qualitative it is absolute and the real problem change of position with its burden of quantitative spatial relations of distance and the rest has been quietly burked m bergson does not tell us how we can distinguish on his theory between stationary and moving objects between real and apparent movement here the question was trembling on my tongue long before he asked it it excites still my burning curiosity but he is not going to satisfy my intellectual prurience never shall i know how he squares it with a theory of movement as absolute and qualitative having demonstrated that extension or space as we perceive and feel it is continuous that only the unreal constructions of mathematics put asunder what the god of immediate consciousness hath joined and that science is in accord with immediate consciousness in returning after all in spite of appearances to the idea of universal continuity and that all breaking up of matter into independent bodies with absolutely determined contours is artificial he finds that the irresistible tendency to constitute a discontinuous material universe comes from life itself you could not have a more brilliant nor i believe a truer picture of the evolution and behaviour of living organisms but it is not a metaphysic that m bergson has given us here unless we are to insist that the operation of carving portions as with a knife out of presumably pre-existing sensible reality lands us in a metaphysic and a bad one at that what i would like to point out is that the faceau lumineux of our needs has taken the place of the old exploded thought relations of idealism the diamond net into which the universe is cast and that while the function of the diamond net was to hold together the function of the faceau lumineux is to break up and carve that is to say life does what thought was blamed for doing it gives rise to discontinuities and distinctions just now declared to be unreal contradictory and artificial vitalism may steal a horse but idealism mustn't look over the hedge and now the contradictions thicken when we carry life's operations further we are prolonging vital movement and turning our backs on true knowledge yet it is science that exacts this prolongation and in the process the materiality of the atom dissolves more and more under the gaze of the physicist we have life itself aiding and abetting him by starting the disastrous process which represents for m bergson an ordinary form of useful action mal a propos transported into the domain of pure knowledge why mal a propos if it belongs to the domain of pure knowledge it belongs if it does not belong we have no grounds for complaint and anyhow life began it however the further the process is carried into that domain the more the physicist is forced to renounce all hypotheses of solid atoms of bodies formed of solid atoms and of real contacts between bodies of such a universe in short on which we have most manifestly a grip why do we think of a solid atom he asks and why of shocks because solids being bodies on which we have most manifestly a grip are those which interest us most in our relations with the external world and because contact is the only means of which we can apparently dispose in order to bring our body into action upon other bodies but very simple experiments show that there is never real contact between two bodies which move each other besides solidity is far from being a state of matter absolutely cut and dried solidity and shock then borrow their apparent clarity from the habits and necessities of practical life images of this kind do not throw any light on the ultimate nature of things <laughs>
these considerations far from leading m bergson to suspect that both in practical life and in the hypotheses of pure knowledge we are dealing with appearances far from throwing doubt on the absolute reality of that time and space movement of which we have immediate consciousness confirm him rather in his view that here if anywhere is the absolutely real world and so while nothing can bridge for him the gulf between this reality and pure knowledge his whole philosophy is based on this distinction we have the apparent contradiction that it is life desire action the very things held to be most manifestly real that are responsible for the work of division which on the theory that life puts together and thought divides should belong to the intellect and on the very next page we are told indeed that while science tends to dissolve it more and more into forces and movements the atom will preserve its individuality for our mind that isolates it the only atom which science knows being to faraday a centre of forces each atom occupying the whole of space to which gravitation extends and all the atoms interpenetrating each other while according to professor thompson it is a ring of invariable form whirling round and round in a perfect continuous homogeneous and incompressible fluid which fills space i am translating m bergson's translation of faraday and professor thompson and m bergson caught between continuity and discontinuity and committed to the theory that the difference between all qualities is absolute while confronted by the view of science and of common sense that movements go on independently of us in space which he admits to be quantitative concludes that real movement is the transport of a state rather than of a thing there will however owing to that admission still be an irreconcilable difference between quality and pure quantity between the world of our heterogeneous sensations and the world of homogeneous movements independent of our sensations unless it can be shown that differences between real movements are more than quantitative that real movements are quality itself to this hopeful idea of real movement as quality m bergson takes his flight let us say then that real movement is quality and see what happens all differences of movement differences in direction distance and velocity will then be qualitative absolute there can be no degrees between approach and distance and between fast and slow we are compelled to think of fastness and slowness and of distance and of approach and flight in terms of absolute irreducible moments a strange doctrine this for a philosopher who insists on the continuity of real space and real movement and of real or pure perception i said compelled to think but this is not an affair of the compulsions of our thinking when you come to quality it is an affair of immediate perception and of life itself and this absoluteness of quality makes not for continuity but for discontinuity as far as external realities are concerned true m bergson distinguishes between this qualitative real movement and the movement which is the subject of mechanics but when it comes as it must come to the relation between the two we are faced with another difficulty the movement which is the subject of mechanics is nothing but an abstraction or a symbol a common measure a common denominator which permits comparison of all real movements among themselves now how in heaven's name can movement thus declared to be purely quantitative serve as a common measure and common denominator of all movements declared to be purely qualitative in movement as such not even immediate consciousness the all reconciler can discern the ghost of absolute quality not until you and science have translated movement into terms of energy into intensity which is quality again can you escape from quantity nor can you altogether escape it here since science presupposes amounts of energy and degrees of intensity which immediate perception knows nothing of not even in the interests of vitalism should we confuse those absolute qualities those immeasurable intensities of sensation which accompany the putting forth of energy with the measurable intensities of energy itself in the same way the movements of our bodies are attended by muscular sensations and sensations of freedom and well-being which are purely qualitative but i think we have no business to argue from them to the quality of movements 
but to return to these real and qualitative movements of which quantitative movements are the common measure and denominator looked at in themselves they are as he says indivisibles which occupy duration presuppose a before and after and bind together the successive movement of time by a thread of variable quality which m bergson says should not be without some analogy with the continuity of our own consciousness if we could draw out this duration that is to say live in a slower rhythm should we not see in proportion as this rhythm slowed down colours fading and lengthening out into successive impressions still no doubt coloured but more and more ready to merge in pure vibrations that is to say unless the brilliance of m bergson's style blinds me to his meaning that those differences in the movements of molecules differences of which i am not immediately conscious by determining the qualities of my sensations of which i am immediately conscious take on continuity and quality so that their world the world of unreal vibrations reflects in some sort the continuity of consciousness we have seen that m bergson uses time as stuffing for the interstices of space we now see him using qualities of sensation as stuffing for the interstices of movement which is as good as a confession that he can no more get continuity out of his real movements than he can out of any other movements and his adroit suggestion of some analogy does not disguise the essential truth of the matter that from first to last it is the continuity of consciousness that has done the trick what are we to make of a theory which seems now our only clue to the very heart and secret of reality and now a splendid mass of incoherences we have the real movements of which m bergson has just said that the movements known to mechanics are the common measure and denominator we know that the laws of physics are based on those very laws of mathematics which are not real in m bergson's sense of reality being the work of the intellect that divides we have the qualities sensations of which we are told that they are absolute that is to say irreducible as any atom and we have movements which but for the quality which is called in to stop their gaps would be as discontinuous as space itself and with these irreducibles m bergson builds up his certainty and the elan vital does not help him since it began the whole business of defining and dividing of burrowing and digging holes as it were in real space and drawing the contours of bodies to suit its own purposes and supposing we were justified in transferring the quality of sensations to the molecular movements to which we are obliged to refer them quantity being thus transformed into quality the common quantitative measure and the common denominator would no longer apply what m bergson does not appear to admit is that all space even real space may be an intellectual construction that there is no perception of extension so immediate as not to presuppose it so pure as not to include it that as the work of thought it is as discreet or as continuous as thought pleases that is to say it may be both and that if it were continuous only as continuous as the real space of m bergson's immediate perception it would be no less quantitative on that account end of part two section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two section two of a defense of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two vitalism section two i do not want to dispute m bergson's conclusions that matter is the vehicle and plastic tool of the elan vital that pure remembrance is a spiritual manifestation and that with memory we are actually in the domain of spirit these are precisely the conclusions to which i believe the balance of the biological and psychological argument inclines but i do not see that these conclusions are supported by a theory which begins and ends in metaphysical dualism that tries to establish reality on the far from stable ground of action plus immediate perception and that 
in spite of having coolly let filter through every consideration inimical to its argument lands itself in perpetual contradictions in its efforts to escape from the position it has created for itself for while it takes its stand on action and immediate perception as alone affording the clue to the real and asks us to suppose such absurdities as that homogeneous space is logically posterior to material things and the pure knowledge that we have of them knowledge that it declares four pages later on to be tainted with the impurity of the sensation isimelon and that extension precedes space at the same time we are to suppose that it is this very same homogeneous space that concerns our action and our action alone m bergson's aim is to escape the pitfalls of realism and idealism alike to résoudre les contradictions to overcome the insurmountable barrier and at the same time to rejoindre la science he finds a common error in the realism of the vulgar herd that takes for granted a world of things existing plump and plain outside and independent of any consciousness and the realism of kant that presupposes a thing in itself independent of and inaccessible to consciousness you wonder why kant should be lumped with the vulgar realist when he made of homogeneous space and of time not barriers erected but forms of the intelligence for the coordination of the data of sense the common error is that both realists made space a condition a priori of experience whereas immediate perception has no a priori elements nothing is a for or after another but our experience consisting mainly and primarily of action so to speak gathers space and time with it as it goes along space and time will thus be given with the sensations coordinated by means of them it is not quite clear whether m bergson means that sensations occur ready coordinated in space and time and that our perception reflects as it were the given coordination or whether it is we who coordinate as we go along from his theory of perception coordination of objects in space would seem to be given from his theory of action that we coordinate would follow anyhow coordination proceeds hand in hand with experience and is not provided for it beforehand the shipwreck of idealism rather is in the passage from the order which appears for us in perception to the order which succeeds for us in science and idealism and realism proceed from a common error in that on both theories conscious perception and the conditions of conscious perception are directed towards pure knowledge and not towards action here m bergson and the great body of modern philosophy with him part company with the metaphysics of the past he has put his finger on the weak spot of all the transcendent theories their neglect of action let us see how a philosophy fares that is directed towards action and action alone in order to escape realism and idealism m bergson identifies perception with preparation for our action having laissez filtre the work of intellect its logical constructions and presuppositions and the account that science gives us of the real or assumed action of external things on the grounds that thought relations and real action are not given in immediate perception but having decided that pure perception is concerned with action and with action alone and that the body is an instrument of action and of action only he has less difficulty than might have been supposed in establishing the correspondence between perception and cerebral states yet we find in this correspondence that the cerebral state is neither the cause nor the effect nor in any sense the duplicate but simply the continuation of perception perception being our virtual action and the cerebral state our action begun it is a correspondence and yet it is a continuation it is a continuation of perception and yet not perception itself now the only way in which one thing can be the continuation of another without being that thing itself is for it to be an effect of that thing the cause passing over into that is to say continuing in the effect and yet this continuation cum correspondence of perception is not its effect and this perception already doubly tainted by identification with our virtual action 
of which our body is the instrument and the action of things upon the instrument is what m bergson calls pure and the taint does not end there this theory of pure perception must be attenuated and completed pure perception is mingled further with affections sensations and recollections memories we have to restore to body its extension and to perception its durée to reintegrate in consciousness its two subjective elements affectivity and memory we have seen what has happened to extension and durée we have now to see what happens to perception and memory m bergson plunging into the very thickness of experience starts with the extremely one-sided proposition that our body is an instrument of action and of action only the true role of perception is to prepare actions perception is he says nothing but selection it creates nothing its role on the contrary is to eliminate from the ensemble of images all those on which i should have no hold then from among the images retained to eliminate all which have no interest for the needs of the image i call my body the body is a centre of action he goes on and of action only in no degree in no sense under no aspect does it serve to prepare still less to explain a representation all in our perception that can be explained by the brain are our actions begun or prepared or suggested and not our perceptions themselves so much for perception when it comes to memory the body preserves motor habits capable of bringing the past again into play also by repetition of certain cerebral phenomena which prolong ancient perceptions it will furnish to remembrance a point of attachment with the actual a means of reconquering a lost influence over present reality we might ask how cerebral phenomena can prolong what they have never been concerned with let that pass we shall be involved in still more serious contradictions before we have done with this theory of perception as a preparer of actions only we are not quite sure whether we are to suppose that the function of perception is not to perceive or whether it is to perceive only those things that make for action here says m bergson is my body with its perceptive centres these centres are shaken and i have a representation of things on the other hand i have supposed that these shakings can neither produce nor translate my perception it is then outside them where is it m bergson has no hesitation in deciding that it is in material objects his grounds for this view of perception are that in posing his body he poses a certain image and with it the totality of other images because his body has its place in this assembly he concludes that his perception must be there also and though the body and its cerebral shakings have nothing whatever to do with his perception which exists outside them can he mean as an independent object in space the unique role of these shakings is to prepare the reactions of his body and to sketch out his possible actions lest we should conclude rashly that in this case the roles of the cerebral shakings and of perception are one and the same he tells us that perception consists in detaching from the ensemble of objects not particular objects or groups of objects but the possible action of my body on them so that whatever else it may be the primary function of perception is not to perceive perception therefore is selection now this is surely giving a somewhat incomprehensible and contradictory account of a complex but perfectly intelligible performance because perception in addition to its obvious function of perceiving of being aware of and its less obvious and possibly disputable function of posing its own objects has a distinct reference to action just as it has a distinct reference to appetite and love and aesthetic emotion and moral attitudes and intellectual interest and cosmic rapture and mystic passion and every conceivable mode of conscious experience because both attention and intention play a part in determining what perception shall dominate our experiences making all allowances for the part they play we are still not justified in contending that perception is nothing but selection with an exclusive reference to action and it is the same with memory its primary function is to evoke all past perceptions which have analogy with some present perception and to recall to us what went before and what followed after and thus to suggest to us the most useful decision among possible decisions true this is not all 
m bergson distinguishes between physical memory which is an affair of motor habit associations and pure memory pure memory holds together in one unique intuition the multiple moments of durée it disengages us from the movement of the flux of things that is to say from the rhythm of necessity but this unique intuition again has a primary reference to action the more memory serves to contract these movements into one the more solid the grip on matter that it gives us so that the memory of the living being seems to measure beforehand the power of its action on things and to be nothing but the intellectual repercussion of it after all pure memory is not so very pure like pure perception it is tied and fettered to action of which alone our bodies are the instrument observe m bergson says the position we thus take between realism and idealism we do observe it we observe that in the interests of the elan vital m bergson has ignored everything in consciousness that does not bear upon action and that in consequence of his wholesale rejections his position is between the devil and the deep sea the deep sea holds all the relations that he has let filter through not only those despised ones which are the logical framework of the actual but those which science reveals as part and parcel of the real and the devil has run away with the possibilities of sensation and the intermediary perceptions which have escaped him but however irrelevant they may be to m bergson's action however slender their grip on matter they are not destroyed the devil and the deep sea still wait for the thinker who denies them supposing that my conscious perception has an end destination which is altogether practical that in the ensemble of things it emphasizes only those which interest my possible action on them i understand that all the rest escapes me and that all the rest nevertheless is of the same nature as that which i perceive how do i how can i know this if all the rest has escaped me in order to suppose that conscious perception has one practical destination i have had to suppose a lot of things besides that homogeneous space is not logically anterior but posterior to material things and to the pure knowledge that we have of them that extension precedes space that homogeneous space concerns our action and our action only being like an infinitely divided band that we hold below the continuity of matter in order to make ourselves masters of it to break it up in the direction of our activities and of our needs this is all very well as long as we are considering the psychology of animals and babies whose adventures in space and experiments in action are neither delayed nor hampered by considerations of the logically anterior but it is to ignore immense departments of adult psychology and it is not what is meant by a metaphysic if it were if what is first in experience were first in reality why not start at once with the human embryo or the protozoon why bother about human psychology at all only you ought to know exactly what you are doing if you may light-heartedly laisser filtre everything that makes realism what it is plus everything that makes idealism what it is on the one hand the real space of mathematics on which all the laws and conclusions of physics are based on the other hand all psychic and logical processes which have no immediate relation to action of which action is not the object and the aim this is indeed to escape both realism and idealism it is to escape all metaphysics but it is hardly to resolve the contradictions or to overcome the insurmountable barriers or to rejoin science but when criticism has shown up all its weak points it remains a superb attempt to reduce the phenomena of consciousness with all its multitudinous references and loves and interests to a unity which shall not leave life and action out of the account for it is true that in action in life taken in the thick as it is lived we do get a fusion of perception and of memory and interest and will of time and space in a continuity and oneness which knows nothing of the contradictions the dilemmas the presuppositions the infinite dividings and limitings of the intellect it is no less true that neither life nor action in itself will deliver the secret of that fusion and that continuity in the very effort to escape those contradictions and dilemmas m bergson has added to them those special contradictions and fallen into those special dilemmas of his own which i have just tried to make clear and what has happened to m bergson is what happens to every philosopher 
who is out looking for his unity in the wrong place that is to say he has put pure time before the self he has given to time that special form of continuity the duration that belongs only to a self he has made pure time in which action happens the beginning that it cannot be and thus brought it again under all the categories of spurious time to avoid the pitfalls that await him as the result of his rash choice in priorities he has transformed all the contradictions and dilemmas of spurious time to space in the evident hope that they will find reconciliation and solution there moreover to escape the net of illusion he has thus prepared for himself he gives to space which he has identified with spurious time the purity and reality he denies to spurious time he is bound to do this in the interests of that outside world which is the playground of the elan vital that is to say in the interests of that ultimate dualism in which vitalism begins and ends but he has shown us that time and space are correlatives and that neither is to be thought of without the other that they work in and out of each other and play into each other's hands we are aware both of the position of objects in space and of the movement of objects from point to point in space which is as it were a sort of succession in space we are aware both of the succession of events in time and of their simultaneity which is as it were a sort of stationariness in time but it is neither space in itself nor time in itself which is holding objects together with pure space alone you will never construct a synthesis of objects in space nor with pure time alone a synthesis of events in time but if either construction is to be valid and intelligible a synthesis must be made of both and that construction and that synthesis if it is to be at all will depend in the last resort on personal identity on an unchanging self on any theory except that of the mechanical equivalent the construction and the synthesis will be made in the last resort in consciousness whether it repeats or whether it corresponds with the arrangements of the independent real or whether construction and synthesis in consciousness is all the construction and synthesis there is for if the self change to each member of a final synthesis or to each member of an incomplete and provisional synthesis if it changed to each term of the intricate system of relations within each synthesis to all the multitudinous changing events in time to all the multitudinous changing objects in space if it had no unity and no duration there would not only be no final synthesis but no synthesis anywhere at all there would obviously be no time and not quite so obviously no space certainly no perception of space and this is positively the last opportunity for the upholders of the superior necessity and priority of memory they may say with the most perfect obviousness much more obviously there would be no time and no perception of space without memory for if time is the form of inner perception and space is the form of outer perception is not memory the synthesis of both but is it could it be because memory holds together all remembered objects in space and all remembered events in time does it follow that it is responsible for the synthesis of time and space taken together or for the entire synthesis under each head it would not be possible unless all consciousness and time and space themselves were nothing but memory but what of the original synthesis the perception of objects in space what of the perception of the first member of a series in time because they have been buried under layers upon layers of repeated images that are memories you cannot say that there never was any original synthesis never any perception of a first member of a series and we are continually confronted with new arrangements of old material new successions in time new juxtapositions in space and though the material is old recognized therefore and remembered as much as perceived the synthesis is new the new perceptions the new synthesis escape forever the net of memory what then holds perception and memory together and is it more truly memory or the self that makes us seize in one unique intuition the multiple moments of duration frees us from the movement of the flux of things from the rhythm of necessity end of part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine
Section One of A Defense of Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Three: Some Ultimate Questions of Psychology. Section One. In what then does individuality consist? Not in our memories, even supposing that they are pure for we have seen that they presuppose us not in our individual experiences in the fact that such and such things happen to us and to nobody else for this is to plant our individuality outside ourselves in precisely those events over which it has least control besides we have no reason to suppose that our experience is unique and every reason to suppose the contrary still when we reflect we do suppose it in the sense not that our experiences are in any way extraordinary but that precisely this order and arrangement of experiences which we call ours has never occurred before but no possible arrangement of experiences will yield or make recognizable a self that is not presupposed in the arrangement and has had no hand in it we have a sense of individuality we find if we look for it that we have a sort of self-feeling i do not mean self-consciousness i am not thinking of our general feeling of possessing a body a feeling which is made up of muscular sensations more or less insistent and of visceral sensations more or less vague i am not thinking of what is called feeling tone for this may differ if not from moment to moment from day to day or even from hour to hour all these feelings which come to us through our bodies help our sense of individuality but i am thinking of something more akin to memory of that feeling which is not memory but which accompanies it and gives it the quality which makes it ours saturating it like a perfume staining it like a colour always recognisable as the same perfume and the same stain to place our individuality in self-feeling is so far satisfactory that it does at least attempt to explain why our memories are recognizable as ours it is as if we scented ourselves out all along our track i may say i do not know whether my experience is really mine or whether i am simply part of an experience labelled mine for convenience sake or granting that i am i i still do not know from moment to moment whether i am the same self or whether another self arises on the top of me and takes possession of my memories but i do know that something reacts with the same feeling to all my memories all along the line that it is reacting now to the contents of my immediate consciousness and that when i dream i shall find it in my dreams and i take it that this something either is me or involves somewhere a continuous and not a discreet me does self-feeling yield the secret of individuality no self-feeling helps to fix our floating sense of individuality and so far justifies us in calling it self-feeling and no doubt it enters largely into the building up of the superstition of the self but our sense of individuality is one thing and the existence of the self another mere self-feeling goes no way towards proving that the self is more than a superstition self-feeling though a fairly continuous accompaniment of memory is vague and from its peculiar vibrant emotional quality we may suspect it to be nothing more than a sort of general reverberation of the memories themselves even if it be something more than that it is something that accompanies consciousness and not anything that could conceivably bind it together and make it one and if personal identity is nothing more than such an accompaniment it will fare no better than if it were nothing more than memory but what about that peculiar vibrant and emotional quality we noted this accompaniment of self-feeling is not always the same it has degrees of intensity it attaches itself more to some memories than others it is stirred to a stronger glow by some associations than by others it seems to know and to remember almost on its own it then has preferences in short self-feeling this indestructible haunter of memories 
has about it more than a suggestion of the will to live in its aspect of interest and desire are we to say then that the secret of personal identity and individuality is to be found in will this certainly seems to bring us nearer to the root of the matter and it has the advantage of being definitely thinkable as antecedent to experience and therefore to memory and of being traceable in the lowest conceivable germ of personality the will to live the need to appear to grow to reproduce the self to gather experience and appear more and more in a sense it is the stronghold of individuality for it is with his will that the individual fences himself off and asserts himself against other individuals it is with his will in the form of interest and love that he draws near to them and is drawn and so makes his personality greater through theirs and theirs through him and at every stage of his biological ascension it is his will that is the mainspring of his sublimations it is through his will through his need want desire interest affection love that he appears as self-determined it is his will as energy that whether in resistance or obedience knits him to the forces of the real world outside himself it is his will that in submitting or aspiring in adoration or in longing links him to the imminent and transcendent reality that he calls god the perfect individual is the person perfectly adapted to reality through the successive sublimations of his will it is clear that the will of such a creature is not any more than his perception or his memory concerned with action only before we go farther let us take stock of our results so far we have refused to identify the self entirely with its own memories to find the secret of personality in the fact that such and such experiences have been ours for this is to plant our personality outside in extraneous and probably accidental happenings without taking account of its interior reactions besides begging the possible question of its existence we found a faint aroma of selfhood in the self-feeling that accompanies a consciousness and though this may be and very probably is due to some inner working of a self and though it has a warmth and intimacy that we look for in vain in what we call self-consciousness it was not comprehensive enough for us to hope to find in it the secret of selfhood so far as that secret is discoverable at all we seem to find it in the will the will seems to us at once the most ancient the most comprehensive and the most intimately self-revealing of the powers of self it seems the surest and the most conspicuous bridge from the inner to the outer world also we have seen every reason for supposing that processes and actions which are now involuntary and unconscious were once conscious and willed we had even some reason for supposing that the very machinery of such processes may have been built up gradually under the impulse of the will that the will working through countless generations may be itself the builder and the engineer of our bodily and mental machinery we considered the theory of vitalism with its assumption of matter as an independent outside solid substance offering itself to the grip of spirit and carved by our needs as by a knife we found that this theory and its attempt to base perception and memory upon action only ends in contradiction and dilemma and we concluded that to refer will likewise to action only is to ignore the actual range of desire and interest and love so wide is that range that we might well rest in the conclusion apparently forced on us that the will is the self and yet if we were to put our conclusion to the test we should find that though it has served us so far infinitely better than self-feeling in memory though so to speak there is more self in will than in memory or self-feeling it still falls short of complete selfhood because though intimate and comprehensive more intimate than either memory or self-feeling it is not comprehensive enough not nearly so comprehensive in fact as memory it will not give us the synthesis we want the synthesis of all our states of consciousness itself included
so far as will is a state of consciousness at all that is to say so far as consciousness includes states which are not states of willing but states of feeling perceiving remembering conceiving judging reasoning and imagining the unity of consciousness cannot be found in will we have now three alternatives a complete irreconcilable dualism between will and idea a dualism that may fall outside consciousness between the will as the unconscious and consciousness as the idea or that may fall inside consciousness itself in which case it is all up with the unity of consciousness or a partial dualism within consciousness which allows of the interpenetration of will and idea and of interaction between them without necessarily admitting selfhood as the unity of all conscious states these two forms of dualism will face us equally whether we regard consciousness as a by-product of the physical mechanism or as wholly or partially independent of it or there is a unity of selfhood of personal identity prior to consciousness as its condition or arising with it at any rate in no sense arising from it a unity in which alone will and idea can be held together for it may be argued it is argued with extreme plausibility that will and idea are in no more awkward position than any other two states of consciousness considered out of relation with each other and that when they are taken in relation the very relations themselves provide all the plaster necessary to stick them together that this will hold good whether the relations are regarded as thought relations in consciousness or as real relations outside it that if these relations do not and cannot bind there is no conceivable unity that added to them will do their binding for them while if they do bind that is enough it is at any rate all we have any right to ask for instance will and idea come together and are sufficiently held together in purpose or design thus the unity of selfhood is either powerless or superfluous this argument is much more formidable than it looks at first sight so formidable that it can only be dealt with later on when we are considering the ultimate questions of metaphysics for the moment our problem is psychological needless to say the hypothesis of unity is thoroughly incompatible with the mechanical by-product theory of consciousness and does not necessarily go with the partial independence theory in itself now i have tried to make it clear under separate heads that personal identity is not memory is not self-feeling is not will but it may be just possible that this disposing of under separate heads was the secret vice of my whole procedure and that though the self cannot be any one of the three it may very well be all three taken together personal identity the self the unity of consciousness may be the sum of our states of consciousness taken together and it may be nothing more in such sort that when there are no more states of consciousness there is no more personal identity and though i have stated repeatedly that this unity and this sum presuppose personal identity i am aware that logical presupposition is not enough unless it can be shown that this unity is more than a sum and that it is of such a sort that it is not only unthinkable but unworkable without personal identity it should not be forgotten that there was another alternative the mechanical by-product theory the theory on which consciousness is as it were given off like a gas by the neural processes which are its physical antecedents and correlates is resolvable into them and ceases when they cease if i have not paused to dispose of this theory before going further it is because i mean to return to it also later on meanwhile if we succeed in establishing personal identity as a working hypothesis the indispensable condition of consciousness as we know it the importance for psychology of the by-product theory will collapse in the process but personal identity must do something for its living before we can be allowed to presuppose it in the light-hearted manner of the foregoing and as i took samuel butler as a classic authority on the behaviour of the psyche in its human and prehuman past 
i am going to take mr william mcdougall as a classic authority and on the whole the clearest simplest and most convincing authority on the behaviour of the psyche here and now not that the two behaviours can be separated or that any modern psychologist would dream of separating them but that while one large part of mr mcdougall's work necessarily overlaps butler's a still larger part deals with psychic powers and processes all the synthetic and higher mental functions which butler leaves untouched and though a great deal of mr mcdougall's work is necessarily founded on that of william james every psychologist's work is bound to cover the same ground as his predecessors and mr mcdougall would be the last to claim a superior originality it also covers ground that has appeared since the publication of william james's principles of psychology besides emphasizing several important points of difference and disengaging the ultimate issue if anything with greater clearness and directness and simplicity so simple and direct and clear is mr mcdougall that he puts a pistol to our heads and presents us with two alternatives and two alone psychophysical parallelism and animism it should be stated at once for fear of misapprehension that mr mcdougall does not make his psychology a diving-board for a plunge into metaphysics he tells us in his preface that metaphysical dualism is an implication he is anxious to avoid but he will have none of psychic monism on any system he affirms a distinct dualism between soul and body and it should be borne in mind that in the absence of any higher unifying principle his animism lands us logically in the pluralistic universe of william james still he not only allows us to have a soul but his aim is to make us see that our consciousness being what it is animism is the only theory which will be found to work before he consolidates his position he overhauls all the alternative philosophical theories and finds that all but two are reducible to some form or other of psychophysical parallelism the two outstanding forms are both monisms and both by-product theories physical monism or materialism which regards consciousness as the illusory by-product of the mechanical process of matter epiphenomenalism and subjective idealism or solipsism or complete egoism which regards the whole universe including matter and its mechanical processes as an illusory by-product of the self alone the three remaining forms are grouped under the head of parallelism namely number one strict psychophysical parallelism which regards physical processes and psychic processes as running on two parallel lines that never meet and have no branch lines that intersect them each line representing a distinct and different system of causation according to this view there is no sense in which the two may be considered one number two phenomenal parallelism which regards physical processes and psychic processes as two aspects modes or appearances of one underlying reality they run on purely phenomenal parallel lines that never meet the underlying reality is spinoza's substance or god kant's thing in itself herbert spencer's unknown and unknowable schopenhauer's and von hartmann's unconscious all these philosophers agree in regarding their underlying reality as neither mind nor matter and in declaring that though it might be a necessary postulate it could not be known they all affirm the complete phenomenal dualism of mind and matter and mr mcdougall is one with their opponents in demonstrating that their metaphysical monism does nothing at all to bridge the gulf but in deference to the underlying unknown they all figure as holders of identity hypothesis a number three psychical monism or objective idealism identity hypothesis b which regards all physical processes and nature the sum of them as products of thought it is the redoubtable theory of the world as arising in consciousness i am following mr mcdougall rather than my own inclination 
in introducing the objective idealist as a parallel liner but mr mcdougall's classification will serve my purpose as well for his sinister intention is to expose the latent dualism of that system not in the interest of any metaphysical monism he may have up his sleeve nor yet of a pluralistic universe for he does not exalt his souls to ultimate principles but for the sake of the cross correspondence he is to prove i do not think that mr mcdougall's dealings with psychical monism are always entirely satisfactory objective idealists might object to being called psychical monists and they would certainly be surprised to find their universe described as the shadow of thought again i think mr mcdougall somewhat underrates the importance of strict psychophysical parallelism which is after all his real or at any rate his legitimate adversary for in an encounter with any of the alternative systems he runs the risk of attacking ultimate metaphysical principles with merely psychological weapons that is to say he may be carrying an argument that holds good in one sphere into another where it may not hold good at all moreover his own theory of animism interaction and all is by no means incompatible with identity hypothesis a for which the soul itself may figure as a phenomenon or aspect of the underlying reality we will see how he disposes of his five alternative theories materialism and subjective idealism the mechanical by-product and self-alone theories fall in easy prey materialism has on its side a formidable array of arguments from fact it can point to certain undeniable and invariable sequences of cause and effect all sorts of disturbances and alterations of consciousness arise when poisons are introduced into the blood from the excitement or stupor of intoxication to the profound coma of bright's disease again my brain processes slacken down and i pass into the unconsciousness of dreamless sleep they are interfered with by the rupture of a blood vessel and either special departments of my consciousness are interfered with or i lose consciousness altogether or for so long as the interference lasts that is to say according to the extent and persistence of the lesion my brain processes cease altogether and the inference seems too obvious to state and yet the extreme conclusion does not follow unless materialism can show that physical processes give rise to consciousness in the first place if they cannot there would be no need to infer that their ceasing must cause its extinction and ultimately the argument for materialism rests on two laws and a corollary the law of causation according to which the cause passes over into its effect and is discernible therein and the law of the conservation of energy according to which all the energy in the universe is a constant quantity which can neither be added to nor diminished the corollary being the biological law of the continuity of evolution mr mcdougall points out in body and mind pages one fifty and one fifty one that the mechanical theory of consciousness saves the law of conservation of energy at the expense of the law of causation for there is no sense in which it can be said that molecular change the presumed cause of sensation passes over into its effect it also breaks the biological law since however undefined however dim the borders between the conscious and the unconscious there could hardly be a greater breach of continuity than the appearance of consciousness when it finally emerges at some point in the course of evolution End of chapter 3, section 1. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 3, section 2 of A Defensive Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 3 Some Ultimate Questions of Psychology section two as for the subjective idealist or the self aloner mr mcdougall does not take the trouble to demolish him regarding the mere statement of his case as sufficient demonstration of its absurdity with a solipsist we cannot argue 
but all of us are agreed that solipsism is an impossible attitude for a sane man so that the true alternative the real opponent is psychophysical parallelism in its three forms identity hypothesis a identity hypothesis b and strict psychophysical parallelism the theory of the two aspects and the underlying identity identity hypothesis a is open to the objection that as the aspects are two events of radically different orders and are apprehended in two radically different ways that is to say are incommensurable and devoid of any common term they are not intelligibly referable to any real process underlying them i confess i cannot understand mr mcdougall's still more serious objection he says very truly that a thing can appear under two different aspects only if and when both aspects are apprehended by the mind of some observer and he argues that because in the case of the physical and the psychical processes which are said to be the aspects of one real process there is no such observer occupying the inner standpoint and apprehending the inner or psychical aspect of the real event except in the altogether exceptional case of the introspecting psychologist therefore neither the real event nor the physical event nor the psychic event are apprehended at all all we know of the real event is its two aspects and all we know of the physical event is known not in its own terms but in terms of consciousness which is the other aspect and only a consciousness that was aware of its own brain processes could occupy the position of observer of the inner event surely all that the theory takes for granted is the undeniable fact of a stream of consciousness and the undeniable fact of a stream of physical events on the one hand the mysterious behaviour of mind on the other the mysterious behaviour of matter including our brain processes which are part of the outer and not of the inner event and is not obliged to presuppose an inner spectator of the entire inner stream you might as well argue that as the physical events are only apprehended partially and not entirely the underlying reality is not manifested in them the real crux of the position being not that there is no spectator of the inner event but that there is one inner spectator of both outer and inner events while of the real event there is not any spectator at all and while both aspects are to some extent given and both to some extent known the underlying reality substance or process in which both are one remains unknown and unknowable a situation baffling to the intelligence yet its supporters might answer that they can't help it if it is and that intelligences were born to be baffled next comes the theory of psychical monism or objective idealism the theory of consciousness as the all the only reality and of the world as arising in consciousness this theory is held in too many forms to be broken quite so easily as mr mcdougall breaks it on the unity of consciousness though his argument is destructive to the loose monism of his own principal opponents my consciousness is a stream of consciousness which has a certain unique unity it is a multiplicity of distinguishable parts or features which although they are perpetually changing yet hang together as a continuous whole within which the changes go on this then is the nature of consciousness as we know it now it is perfectly obvious and universally admitted that my stream of consciousness is not self-supporting is not self-sufficient is not a closed self-determining system it is admitted that each phase of the stream does not flow wholly out of the preceding phase and that its course cannot be explained without the assumption of influences coming upon it from without what then are those influences the psychical monist must reply they are other consciousnesses how then about the process by which the other consciousnesses the other streams of consciousness influence my stream of consciousness is this also consciousness for we are told all process is conscious process if so it also is a stream of consciousness and it must influence my stream through the agency of yet another stream and so on ad infinitum 
thus my consciousness itself by reason of the fact that it hangs together as a stream of process relatively independent of other streams of process implies the essence of what is meant by substantiality namely the continuing to have or to be a numerically distinct existence in spite of partial change body and mind pages one sixty two and one sixty three the fact of the unity of consciousness can certainly not be accounted for or explained on the simple theory of consciousness as a stream or streams or as any sequence or even conglomeration of merely associated states the inner weakness of this form of psychical monism is confessed by one of its ablest representatives professor c a strong who turns up more than once in mr mcdougall's pages with his distressful query what holds consciousness together as it is manifestly impossible to get any unity out of a stream or rather out of many streams he is driven to the hypothesis of psychical dispositions as a substitute for a soul but psychical dispositions must either also be part of the stream or streams in which case it is not easy to see how unity is to be got out of them or they must be raised to the rank of extra mental realities and a system of such realities neither simple nor undivided yet quite sufficiently active will form our substitute for the soul so good a substitute that mr mcdougall sees no difference between this theory and animism i am still following mr mcdougall and for the moment i must ignore as he does the older theories of objective idealism its adherents so far from regarding consciousness as a flux saw it held together as a firm net of thought relations to which it owes its objectivity for them the unity of consciousness was as the very rock of their belief mr mcdougall like his opponents professor strong professor paulson professor munsterberg and all the witnesses to psychical monism whom he summons up look upon consciousness both as a stream and as something essentially disjointed and they all cry aloud for something to hold it together he has no difficulty in breaking all their backs one after the other over the unity of consciousness and finally settling them with the problem of unconsciousness it is obvious that a stream of consciousness even with central whirlpools in it of psychical dispositions cannot have periods or even moments of unconsciousness without ceasing to exist there are other arguments drawn from other qualities of consciousness but these too are sufficient for the destruction of the psychical monist fechner the author of strict psychophysical parallelism is twice broken once as a parallelist and once as a psychical monist it is hard to see why fechner should be involved in the special ruin of the psychical monist though he certainly held a somewhat unstable position midway fechner's case is peculiar he starts with a vigorous parallelism and then by what seems the masterly inconsistency of his enthusiasm lands himself in psychical monism with his theory of panpsychism all the same he never abated one jot of his parallelism in his serious psychophysic but his panpsychism lands him peacefully in animism side by side with mr mcdougall so far as he gives the ghost of personal identity to his souls but after all what does his inconsistency amount to he held that wherever we find matter we find mind in some degree however low not the smallest grain of inorganic dust that has not its psyche and he held that wherever we find mind we find matter this position he defended to the last against all his opponents so far fechner must be judged a parallel liner inside his system he is almost fanatically consistent but he had an imaginative genius that would have been dangerous to any system and it carried him far beyond the limits of his own but when we come to the strict psychophysical parallel liners backbreaking isn't quite so simple a matter for they are the people who are punctiliously just in weighing the claims of both sides they refuse on any consideration to let the balance tip to one or the other and as mr mcdougall is if anything still more punctilious and still more just it is not so easy for him to make out a case for animism against them they are less vulnerable because less adventurous 
fechner's follower wundt who outdoes his master in simple parallelism is a formidable adversary whose views require rather more detailed consideration he lays down his parallel lines with laborious science and strenuousness and he runs his system along them with sobriety and discretion if it leaves the rails it is not because wundt allows himself to be distracted by ecstatic visions of the cosmic soul never on wundt's theory can the two lines the physical process and the psychical process hope to meet between them there is equivalence and point-to-point -point correspondence for every neural change a psychic change for every psychic change a neural change with a sequence so invariable that where we can detect the one we may infer the other but no connection no cross correspondence from line to line no interdependence no interaction in psychophysical organisms body and soul are for our immediate knowledge one being not different when from all natural phenomena and therefore from all phenomena of physical life we carefully abstract the psychic processes it is obvious that from these objective processes thus stripped of their subjective side subjective properties could never be deduced just as vice versa the deduction of physical life processes from psychic experiences as such is impossible body and soul are a unity but they are not identical they are not the same but they are properties that are found together in all living beings they are not the same how are we to conceive the relation between them their unity we are to conceive it as a parallelism and the law of parallelism runs thus as he says wherever and whenever we find ordered relations between psychical and physical phenomena these are neither identical nor interchangeable for they are not comparable one to the other but they are related to each other in such a way that certain physical processes correspond regularly with certain psychical processes or to use a figurative expression they go parallel to one another this definition which we prefer to keep now that it has been once for all introduced into psychophysiology is however only half correct it expresses very aptly the fact that the groups of phenomena here brought into correlation are not identical but not that there is no ground of comparison between them there is no bridge from the mechanical causality that rules on the physical line to the teleological causality that rules on the psychic line take the case he says of an act of will try to break up the links proper to the combined psychophysical series completely into their physical elements in such a process starting point and ending point will be connected up through all the intermediary links in the chain and through all the conditions that accompany them but this connection can never be thought of otherwise than as a purely causal one whereas we cannot make the proper teleological connection between ending point and starting point of the psychic series until after the series is actually completed according to the universal character of teleological connections that is to say in tracing the steps of the physical process we go back and find the cause at the beginning and the effect at the end of the series while in the psychic series we go forwards and find the cause the design or purpose of our act of will at its end and not at its beginning an act of will has always reference to the future is grounded in the future while the physical event is grounded in the past again in physical causality cause and effect are equivalent the cause passes over into the effect so that there is nothing in the effect that was not already contained in the cause in psychic causality the effect is by no means already contained in the cause and may be out of all proportion to it and it may be added like causes do not necessarily produce like effects only of subjective motive as distinct from objective end or purpose can it be said that it is already contained not in the actual result of any given action but in its general direction or tendency the actual result may be something that goes far beyond anything contemplated in the purpose something for which the motive is utterly inadequate for instance i want to inflict a slight physical injury on my neighbour for his good reformation is my motive chastisement my end or purpose 
death by unrealized and undreamed of violence the actual result neither violence nor death were a part of my purpose they are in no way contained in nor are they commensurate with my motive but chastisement may be said to be included in my general policy of reformation i suppose it is something of this sort that wundt means by motives being already contained in the direction of these results as causes are in their effects in this sense he says every psychic connection of the immediate contents of consciousness forms both a causal and a teleological series and that not merely in the general regressive sense which holds good of all natural causality but also in that specially progressive sense by which the end itself becomes cause and as such precedes its effect to be sure here too the end which as motive precedes its effect is not identical with it and thus far in this case also there remains a margin of causality which stretches beyond causality itself teleological judgment is based on this discrepancy between the end proposed and the end accomplished it is a nice question of on the one hand as he says comparing such and such results with the motives which inevitably tend towards them and on the other hand of valuing motives according to the probable results it will be seen at once that wundt does not by any means belittle the psychic role he has made over to it the whole realm of teleology a very handsome concession and of moral values we shall see how much more he has conceded when we come to his law of the creative resultants for the moment the chief points to notice about his parallel lines are first that there is no common term and no common value between them no bridge of any sort between the dual systems of mechanical and teleological causality next that every causal change is the last link in a series of changes having their starting point in the vast physical universe outside the body whereas the psychic changes have apparently no world of equivalent vastness to which they may be referred on the other hand the psychic processes show what william james would have called a thickness of their own they are not only sequences but syntheses they not only follow on but stick together and stick together in such a way that the whole has a different quality from its parts that is to say it is something more and other than the sum of the several states which compose it and is therefore a new thing for this newness and unexpectedness and otherness that we meet with in every psychic synthesis wundt found an admirable expression in his principle of the creative resultants he calls them resultants to show that it is from single and empirically provable elements or groups of elements that the synthesis is made and in a strict accordance with law analogous to that synthesis by which the components of a mechanical movement give rise to their resultants but he qualifies the process with the adjective creative to show that as he says the effect is not as in the case of a resultant movement of the same kind and value as its components but that it is a specifically new event made ready but not ready made by its elements and that its characteristic value marks a newer and a higher stage than theirs for instance as he says a sound is more than the sum of the tones that compose it while these are melted into a unity the ground tone gains a color of its own through the overtones which because of their lesser intensity have become powerless as independent elements these make it a very much richer sound than it could be as a simple tone likewise every spatial perception is a product or result in which again certain elements have lost their independence and impart to the result a completely new property the spatial order of sensations again in processes of willing the multiplicity of motives finally gives rise to more and more complex forms of willing which again as original psychic products are differentiated from the single elements of motive which compose them but lest we should build too much on this creative principle we are warned unmistakably that it refers only to syntheses and relations of such psychic contents as hold together immediately and never to such as are completely separated even with these belong to a single individual consciousness in short it is a principle that applies only to particular psychic events not a law that rules in spiritual evolution generally
End of quote. And we can no more draw conclusions from it as to the future of existing spiritual values or of spiritual beings than we can argue as to the future of the physical world from the law of conservation of energy meanwhile the back of materialism is broken in psychic processes we have got another principle of causality altogether we have something so new so different that it cannot possibly be accounted for by any mechanical or material process so far so good but can strict parallelism be kept up surely parallelism implies correspondence of the events on one line with events on the other and on a system of strict correspondence we should expect to find that all events on one line were represented somewhere on the other or at least that all ascertainable sequences could be shown to correspond point for point even when physical groupings do not correspond with psychic groupings and vice versa but it is difficult to see on the one hand how several million vibrations whose psychic correlate is a sensation of colour are represented in the psychic event or on the other hand how any conceivable grouping of nerve and brain cells could represent or correspond with the perception of objects in the field of vision even if different qualities of sensations of the same class are represented by differences in the rate of vibrations it is still difficult to see how differences between classes the difference for instance between sight and hearing are represented by any conceivable differences in the construction or disposition or chemical quality of molecules in the visual and auditory nerves end of chapter three section two Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 3, Section 3 of A Defense of Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 3, Some Ultimate Questions of Psychology, Section 3 so that from the first moment of rudimentary consciousness parallelism breaks down and when the psychic plot broadens and deepens and its thickness becomes apparent the system definitely leaves the rails if it cannot stand the strain of such a simple psychic process as elementary sensation how is it going to stand the strain of any psychic processes less simple than those which are supposed to be accounted for on the association theory true if memory and the association of ideas are no more than the psychic response to repeated stimulus of the same associated nerve and brain cells the faithful correlate of a purely physical association fixed by repeated treading of the same nervous tract then physical habit and psychic habit will run perfectly parallel the parallelist task is even simpler than the associationist since he has not got to account for the psychic process causally at all we shall see how it is this too great simplicity of his that wrecks him here the crucial question raised by mr mcdougall turns on meaning the parallelist he says has to believe that purely mechanical determination runs parallel with logical process and issues in the same results he has to believe or at any rate assert that every form of human activity and every product of human activity is capable of being mechanically explained consider then a page of print the letters and words of a logical argument are impressed upon the page by a purely mechanical process but what has determined their order their order is such that when an adequately educated person reads the lines he takes the meaning of the words or sentences follows the reasoning and is led to and forced to accept a logical conclusion as for the author for him the meaning and the logical drift of his words and sentences was present in his consciousness before and during and after the process of writing his foreseen and foregoing purpose was to demonstrate his meaning Quote, his choice of words in order was determined by this purpose by the desire to achieve an end a result which existed only in his consciousness 
now the parallelist necessarily maintains that all this process is in principle capable of being fully explained as the outcome of the mechanical interplay of the author's brain processes that a complete description of the mechanics of these processes would be a complete explanation of the ordering of the letters words and sentences End quote. i do not think that it is fair to the parallelist to fasten on him a belief that the mechanical process if known would account for the teleological process for that is precisely what the strict parallelist denies and wundt would have been the first to insist on the purely teleological character of the process described enough if the animist can show that there is a teleological process on the physical line that interaction gives a better account of what goes on on both lines and that causation and teleology so far from being mutually exclusive involve each other mr mcdougall then asks is there or is there not any complete brain correlate of that part of our consciousness which we call meaning the same question is crucial for memory memory as nerve habit association is the great psychic stronghold of the parallelist and if it can be shown that meaning is a determinant of association and of memory the stronghold will be very badly shaken in considering how associations are actually formed mr mcdougall gives us a very clear and simple statement of the case our consciousness he says comprises again and again complex conjunctions of sensations which show no appreciable tendency to become associated together it is only when the attention is turned upon the objects that excite sensations and when the sensations enter into the process of perception serving as cues that bring some meaning to consciousness that associations are formed and even then the forming of an effective neural association is by no means an immediate and invariable result End quote. he illustrates this point by his own experience in teaching his son a clever and observant child of six the boy had no difficulty in learning the alphabet and recognizing the forms of the letters but when it came to naming each letter separately many hundreds of repetitions were required to fix the mechanical association between the form of the letter and its name in learning to name numbers from one to ten he says an even larger number of repetitions of the naming were required to establish really effective associations this experience brought home to me very vividly the great difference between memory and mechanical association for the boy who required so many hundred repetitions for the establishment of these simple mechanical associations would often surprise me by referring to scenes and events observed by him months or even years previously sometimes describing them in a way that seemed to imply vivid and faithful representation yet the memory pictures of such scenes involved far more complex conjunctions of partial impressions than did the remembering the name of a printed letter or number the essential difference between the rememberings of these two kinds was that in the one case meaning was at a minimum and remembering depended almost wholly upon mechanical a neural association of the nature of a habit whereas the complex scenes and events remembered in some instances after a single perception only were full of meaning how crucial this factor of meaning is will be realized when we consider the established psychological fact that as he says an impression which is already associated with others acquires new associations with more difficulty than one which is free from previously formed associations and that the difficulty is greater the greater the number of the previously formed associations hence on the theory of mechanical association the richer the meaning the greater should be the difficulty of combining any complex of sense impressions and of reproducing them as one memory picture it is therefore impossible to account in this way for the fact that impressions which convey much meaning are combined and remembered with so much less difficulty than those of little meaning mr mcdougall might have added that mechanical associations have the longer ancestral history they have been practised longer so that we should expect their physical machinery to work with such an ease and readiness 
as to render them prepotent in determining remembrance what actually happens is clean contrary to this the higher and biologically more recent power of appreciation of meaning rules the event it must not be supposed that mr mcdougall by any means underrates the other side of the question neural associations or habits he says may so link groups of sensory elements of the brain as to lead to successive revival of the corresponding sensory complexes in so far as each sensory complex has evoked meaning in the past it tends to revive it upon its reproduction and reinstate the idea in consciousness this is the process of the evocation of an idea from the neural side it plays only a subordinate part in the higher processes of remembering for the idea is more than its sensory content it is a compound of sensory content and meaning and meaning as we have seen has escaped the net of neural association yet the prepotency of meaning argues its persistency but how or where do meanings persist clearly mr mcdougall says they do not persist as facts of consciousness but the development of the mind from infancy onwards consists largely in the development of capacities for ideas and thoughts of richer fuller more abstract and more general meanings if then meanings have no immediate physical correlates or counterparts in the brain and if the meanings themselves do not persist we must suppose that the persistent conditions of meanings are psychic dispositions End quote if anybody has a lingering doubt as to the possibility of what is called the psychic increment of psychical dispositions and of psychophysical interactions let him ask himself what would happen if the automaton theory of association really held good the question is crucial for while all the higher mental processes are based on association it is still possible to acknowledge the creative value in wundt's sense of a logical synthesis and to deny strenuously that the psyche has a hand in the associations themselves let us suppose then that it has no hand that it must always take what associations are given to it without any means of selection and rejection other than the automatic stamping out of weaker and less frequent associations by stronger and more frequent ones and that these associations are formed strictly by neural habits we are told that when two or more impressions are received together either often enough or with sufficient intensity a neural tract from one to the other is set up within the brain cell where both have met a track which henceforth becomes a line of least resistance so that either on the actual repetition of the one impression or its revival in memory the other through the revived stimulation of the brain cell spontaneously and inevitably leaps forth suppose that this is all there is in it suppose that we remember never because we choose but always because we must and that our memories are at the mercy of all sorts of random associations being nothing but the revived stimulation of the brain cells where neural paths having once met meet forever suppose that there are no psychic dispositions no psychic interferences no psychic preferences and no selections and rejections of associations then our consciousness would be like nothing on earth but an immense fantastic telephone exchange an exchange where messages indeed received and registered and answered themselves but all at once and in overwhelming multitudes an exchange deafened and disorganized bells ringing incessantly all through its working hours messages rushing in from all parts of the city and suburbs at once crossed and recrossed by trunk calls from all parts of the outlying country casually crossing and recrossing interrupting and utterly obliterating each other on these lines neither logical departments nor central control could possibly exist yet without some one central sorting and supervising system a system which refused more calls than it received mere automatic association would have no more method about it than that mad telephone exchange what is the more likely not to say more conceivable theory 
that the brain which is itself the exchange the distracted hall where the infinite number of wires meet and mingle without aid selects and rejects orders gives meaning supervises and controls or that the psyche uses the brain and the memories which have become the habits of its body and its brain as its machine and its vehicle and that the secret of its remembering and forgetting is its own but if psychical disposition determines the higher forms of memory what then determines psychical disposition as mr mcdougall does not raise this question we may take it that he considers the soul itself to be sufficient answer but as you cannot cut the individual soul clean off from its own history from its long past existences it is just possible that pre-acquired experience may have determined its individual disposition in the absence of any permanent factor persisting in and partly determining those experiences themselves if there be such a permanent factor persisting through past experiences and in part determining them it is the will and the will itself will be in part determined by past experience so much enterprise in seeking new experience so much adaption to each experience found go back to the earliest experiences of all say that the first bit of protoplasm is formed in fulfilment of some need that the amoeba improvises a stomach because it wants to and that our protoplasmic forefather did the same thing for the same sufficient reason he may be supposed to have taken the next step and the next step after that also for the same reason his want or will determining his development and slowly but surely shaping his memory his associations and his meanings when he has any till in the long run his intelligence immensely helping it has shaped the psychical disposition he is born with if at the top of the scale to-day mr mcdougall's son's memory is determined by meaning is not that because of his psychic predilection or choice of meanings is it rash to suppose that some such cumulative effect of will comes under the head of that psychic increment of energy which as mr mcdougall suggests may in all probability influence the behaviour of organisms he is trying to show that the law of conservation of energy is not in itself fatal to the hypothesis of the psychic increment all living organisms he says show certain peculiarities of behaviour that are not established by any inorganic aggregations of matter the peculiarities of behaviour of living organisms especially the power of resisting the tendency to degradation of energy which seems to prevail throughout the inorganic realm are correlated with that is to say they constantly go together with the presence of psychophysical processes in them and this fact of correlation implies causal relation between the two things the few experiments which go to show that the energy given out by an organism is equal in amount to the energy taken in are far too few and too rough to rule out the possibility that psychical effort may involve increment of energy to the organism for increments far too small to be detected might effect very important changes in the course of the organic processes End quote if this hypothesis remains unjustified we have the alternative possibility that mind may exert guidance upon the brain processes without altering the quantity of energy in either case the physical law of conservation is not one that can be legitimately applied to energies presumably of a different order it seems to me that both alternatives that of the psychic influx or increment of energy and that of the guiding influence of mind are a little vague besides being vulnerable to any experiment that may yet establish the law of conservation of energy in living organisms whereas we do find that every act of will is accompanied by the release of energy so much so that desire seeking fulfilment may be said to be psychic energy itself anyhow whether as release or as influx it is the one psychic factor that appears the fittest to play the decisive evolutionary role it is the one that lies nearest to life itself 
that has the deepest ground in our past and the highest reach into our future we have seen how the psychic increment may work at the human level in the case of mr mcdougall's son let us see now what part it plays at a level slightly lower than the human in the case of professor thorndyke's cat mr mcdougall is considering the process of acquiring new modes of bodily response to impressions by adaptation and movement professor thorndyke testing animal intelligence by various experiments hit upon the simple one of shutting up a hungry cat in a cage within sight of a saucer of milk placed outside the door of his cage was closed with a latch which it was just possible for the cat to open by a happy accident in his struggles to escape the cat he said stimulated by the sight of food placed near the cage makes a great variety of movements clawing scratching and squeezing in all parts of the cage it runs through its vocabulary of movement without the least indication that it appreciates the presence of a door or of a latch by moving which the door may be opened sooner or later in the course of these random movements the latch is moved by happy accident and the cat escapes to enjoy the food now it is found that in nearly all cases if the cat is put back in the same cage on many successive occasions it gradually learns to escape more and more quickly until eventually it goes straight to the latch and makes the necessary movement now on any theory which absolutely excludes the psychic factors of desire and choice and denies that movement can be determined by anything but neural habit associations the cat's readiness to acquire the habit of the right movement is inexplicable why just that particular movement of all the movements he has made and repeated each repetition setting up a neural habit why should the habit of the successful movement override the habits of the unsuccessful movements which have had the advantage of the start if desire and its fulfilment if success or failure are not to count it is not necessary to keep a cat hungry and shut him up in a cage within sight of food in order to test the power of psychic associations over neural ones everybody who has lived with animals and loved them and gained their love must have observed what i may call the prepotency of their acquired affections over long-established habit associations i am not sure whether one may speak of the prepotency of acquired characteristics but an illustration will make my meaning clear my own cat like other cats is obsessed by his motor habits perhaps his most persistent motor habit is his garden game of running away and hiding in the bushes when i try to catch him indoors he is not happy unless he is sitting in my lap there he may be easily caught and will even offer himself to be carried like an infant in arms out of doors he will not come to any call he will not be caught or touched by any hand my approach is the signal for his flight all through this summer and last spring and summer and autumn all through the spring and summer and autumn before that he kept up his garden game with the same fixed gestures the same lovely ritual of play a ritual so invariable as surely to have become automatic this autumn i went away for seven weeks when i came back he was not in the house i could hardly suppose that if he was in the garden he would come to me since he had formed no habit of coming when he was called still i called him and in an instant he appeared on the wall of the next garden but one he stood there and stared at me till he had put the voice and the figure together then he came running fast along the connecting wall into his own garden and straight into my arms the rush of affection and of reminiscence had carried it over all the motor habits of the garden game and over all his ancestral memories of pursuit and flight now if parallelism cannot well account for the behaviour of professor thorndyke's cat still less can it account for the behaviour of my cat there are yet other psychic factors besides desire and its opposite aversion which are not represented on the physical side there are pleasure and displeasure and there is a further problem do these psychic factors or does some neural process determine the movements of organisms 
grant that pleasant experiences are beneficial and unpleasant experiences hurtful if then i am still quoting mr mcdougall pleasure and displeasure are themselves the determinants of movements of appetition and avoidance we can understand how this general agreement between the beneficial and the pleasurable and between the hurtful and the disagreeable has been brought about by natural selection and if he says we adopt the parallelist assumption that two neural processes the physical correlates of pleasure and displeasure which we may call x and y are determinants of appetition and aversion then the correlation throughout the animal world of x with the beneficial and of y with the hurtful bodily affections follow from the darwinian principle but that x should express itself in consciousness as pleasure and y as displeasure would remain an insoluble problem again he says and if it be asked are we then to believe that the feelings themselves act directly upon cerebral processes the answer must be i think no they act only indirectly namely by exciting conation or psychical effort for a conation is essentially the putting forth of psychical power to modify the course of physical events now the parallelist and the materialist with him might say why drag in psychical effort to account for movements of appetition and aversion which you have allowed to be determined by x and y on the theory psychical effort can do no more than show itself as a movement of appetition and aversion which has been already accounted for the animist can only down him by showing that psychic effort does do more it does so much by way of modifying physical events that its teleological action deflects the teleological line from the parallel and sends it cutting across the causal line continually the parallelist diagram of the transaction should stand thus in the left column physical and causal line on the right column psychic and teleological line on the left column movement accomplished on the right column movement desired as end on the left column neural process on the right column sense impression end of chapter three section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three section four of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three some ultimate questions of psychology section four these are positively all the factors that the strict parallelist is justified in taking into account if his lines are to remain strictly parallel and if point for point correspondence is to be perfect the diagram is absurd but it is beautifully simple as on any theory of rigid parallelism it is bound to be you will notice that interaction is inexorably barred there is no bridge to or from the causal physical process on the one side to the psychic teleological process on the other you will also notice that no teleological action has taken place it need not take place because neural process a has led directly to the accomplishment of movement b and it cannot take place because clearly movement b is accomplished on the physical line and there is no means of transferring it to the psychic line so the parallelist must either give up his teleology or agreeing that teleological action has taken place he must admit that it has contributed to an effect the movement accomplished on the physical line in which case he gives up his parallelism and goes over to the theory of interaction i do not want to complicate this problem unnecessarily but if we introduce the factor of time and we cannot ignore it some very odd consequences will follow for we have not forgotten that on the two lines of physical and teleological causation 
what is last in the physical series as effect appears first in the psychic series as cause i am not trying to circumvent parallelism by arguing that an action accomplished is identical with an action designed and that consequently the same thing besides existing both as the cause and the effect of itself must exist as cause at the same instant of time when as effect it has not yet come into existence for there is no reason why the same thing should not behave as cause and effect respectively at different instants of time and it is quite impossible to establish point-for-point -point correspondence of the series of instants in time with the series of physical and psychic events so as to force the conclusion that the time of those different behaviours is the same i suggest none of these absurdities on the contrary in spite of that diagram i would insist that action physically accomplished and action as purpose or end are two separate events divided it may be by a long period of time and by many intervening processes of which one event invisible incalculable psychic most truly determines the other which is visible calculable and physical inasmuch as the inner event is the one factor without which the outer event would not have happened and i would suggest that this being so it is not the antecedent neural process but the antecedent psychic process that is the prime causal factor but to return to the case of professor thorndyke's cat there were other psychic factors not represented on that diagram which cannot be ignored what has happened in the case of professor thorndyke's cat the cat has received his pleasant sense impression of the milk outside his cage he has hit on the lucky means of escape and established a pleasant memory of the beneficial result after a few experiments which he makes himself a connection but what connection is established between a the sense impression of the milk and b the movement which unlatches the door so that in future sense impression a is instantly followed by movement b now besides these two terms there stands on the psychic line a third term c the cat's pleasure or satisfaction his pleasure and his pleasant memory are really two terms or if we count repetitions they are as many as you like but for the purpose of the problem they may be taken as one this third term is of supreme importance in determining b it not b the movement itself is the real final cause the motive purpose or end of b for the pleasure or satisfaction of drinking milk is that for which the cat makes his experiments and his successful movement but though the psychic event c will no doubt be represented on the physical line by some point of neural change c on the parallelist hypothesis c again must be a superfluous and impertinent interloper since the sense impression and the memory of a the sight of the saucer of milk or rather its representative neural change a is sufficient to bring about the movement b by nervous discharges along a path of least resistance going direct that is to say without psychic intervention from a to b direct because the question is not of the neural reflexes naturally involved but of psychophysical interaction so direct is it in this sense that given strict correspondence the process on the psychic line each term accompanied if you like by its meaningless note of neural change ought to stand a to b without any intermediary c the cat's pleasure which by the way has grown by repetition from one more or less simple sensation to a perfect pile of memories and anticipations of pleasure the cat's pleasure so immensely important and personal to him counts for nothing in the parallelist programme though to the cat and to his master it must rank as the chief actor in the psychic drama if it comes to that is it can it really be the chief actor or even the chief motive power behind the cat's movement is his memory and before it his anticipation of pleasure so that even if we count the sensation and the memory and the anticipation as one determinant the psychic plot thickens before our eyes 
and if we are really to do justice to the whole action we must assume a fourth factor d the cat's desire eliminate his desire and his whole behaviour becomes meaningless his pleasure is meaningless his movement is meaningless he might just as well keep quiet in his cage true he would not desire the milk if he had no pleasure in it it is equally true however that he would have no pleasure in it if he did not desire it and the peculiarity of this factor of desire is this that it does not enter the series as a single member of the series a b c or d but is present to each member of the series a d b d c d and to the whole in a way in which they are not present to each other for instance he desires his pleasure and he desires the movement which is his means to his pleasure but he has no pleasure in the movement itself his desire saturates his sense impression a of the saucer of milk and his pleasure c and his memory and anticipation of pleasure and it is surely the true causal determinant of his movement b and if you say the parallelist is bound to say it since he is committed to the teleological view of the series a b c if you say and insist that his desire d is determined by his pleasure c which thus appears as the final cause of the movement b still you cannot eliminate the factor of desire without doing violence to the whole series with which it is so intimately platted up i think therefore you are driven to acknowledge it not as the final cause for pleasure fills up that role quite adequately and not as the immediate working cause for that is a complicated affair of nervous discharges and muscular tissues but as the determinant of or ruling causal factor in the movement b then you have got as clear a case of that trespass which is interaction as the animist could well desire and the parallelist dilemma stands thus if he was justified in regarding the series a to b which stands for the neural lines of least resistance representing habit association and habit memory if he is justified in regarding this series as sufficiently determining b he is obliged to ignore the obviously existing psychic factors of pleasure and desire determinants of series a to b but as in any case on his own showing it must have been sense impression a that started the whole business some form of causation other than the teleological has surreptitiously crept in on the psychic line contrary to the sacred law laid down by himself in the beginning for clearly without the psychic intervention of the original sense impression a the precise and particular fact we are considering though possible would not have been actually accomplished so that in the most elementary process of psychophysical life his rule which forbids interaction has been broken if on the other hand he acknowledges as he is bound to do the existence of the psychic factors pleasure and desire he will find one of them desire breaking loose obstreperously from the teleological line and invading again the causal side as determinant of the movement b in this case he has to add to his embarrassment a whole psychic series within a to b in which c and d stand as the chief factors a whole psychic series for which it would be hard to find point for point correspondence on this physical line parallelism therefore breaks down badly in three places its law which demands correspondence breaks down and its law which forbids cross correspondence breaks down and its law which distinguishes between causal and teleological lines breaks down and a better diagram of the real situation would stand thus you have there a vision of the entire collapse of the most obvious crumpling and buckling and cross-cutting of the lines while the animist has established a sort of ascending spiral as his image i must not father this image on mr mcdougall but i think it is justified by the ensemble of the process and yet we have not got farther than the simple psychology of professor thorndyke's cat imagine then what a diagram would look like that attempted to represent the higher psychic processes of man the complex play of many motives determining one of many actions seen to be possible and desirable 
the conflict between desire and will the element of choice the will darting like a shuttle to and fro among all those infinite threads and weaving them to its own pattern add to this the emotions saturating the web with their own colours and consider that you have not yet allowed for the intellectual fabric different and distinct from this play of action and emotion and desire yet hardly distinguishable so close is the psychic web so intricate the pattern when you come to the work of the adult human intelligence we do not yet know enough about animal intelligence to say with any certainty what goes on there to even such an apparently simple operation as the perception of an object in space and of its relation to other objects in space it is even more obvious that you are no longer dealing with a series alone but with a synthesis add to this what is inseparable from it the perception of change of the succession of events in time and your synthesis will be a synthesis of successions and juxtapositions or contemporaneous existences in which events will be perceived as moving one after another and all together against a complex background of objects immobile in space add to this the mere perception of their innumerable relations and to this the higher operations of the intellect the innumerable concepts involved in the most elementary process of acquiring knowledge and you get a series of syntheses and the synthesis of this series add the operations of judgment and of reasoning inseparably bound up with this process then abstract these operations from the process and examine them you will find not only that they follow a certain fixed order of their own the laws of inductive and deductive logic but that yet another operation has crept in analysis and that these syntheses so laboriously built up in consciousness are in consciousness dissolved and broken up in order that new syntheses new combinations associations and arrangements may be formed this is wundt's principle of the creative resultants with a vengeance as mr mcdougall points out with that one rash word creative wundt gives the whole show of psychophysical parallelism away and i do not think it is unfair to hold him to it there is no wriggling out of the awkward position it has created for him and if we are offered our choice between parallelism and interaction i can see no grounds for hesitation parallelism is a sort of psychological bookkeeping by double entry under such conditions that the values on whose constancy the integrity of the result depends change not only between the dates of invoice and account but with every separate item in the ledger so that the parallelist books never really balance whereas the interactionist allows for every fluctuation in the values while equally pledged to the austerity and sanctity of bookkeeping now i think the fact of psychophysical interaction is fairly demonstrated but so far from giving us the metaphysical security we are seeking it leaves that side of the problem as much as ever in the dark psychology suggests the ultimate questions it cannot answer we cannot strike a balance of interactions and say whether physical or psychic action tips the scale we do not know how far psychic action can modify the order of physical events there are certain long established not to say invariable sequences such as the course of the stars and the formation of water from the union of h two o with which we are pretty sure it cannot interfere you can persuade a plant or an animal to breed and grow the way you want it within certain strictly defined and very important limits but you cannot force a single particle of inorganic matter to behave contrary to its pre-established habit still there are certain physical alterations that you can effect you can dam back the tides and divert the course of rivers you can change the outward appearance of the habitable globe by merely displacing things on its surface you can turn steam into a cylinder so as to drive an engine you can so regulate a current of electricity or an explosion of petrol as to make them do the same thing 
so that if a diagram could be drawn showing the physical results of the psychic processes of a few enterprising individuals it might not equal our imaginary psychic diagram in complexity but it would be a very imposing and intricate affair shut up a puppy by himself in your study when he is teething or let loose a speculative builder over a square mile of virgin wood and field and observe the change their psychic processes will effect in the order and integrity of material objects in twenty minutes the puppy has gnawed the backs off your books and worried the hearth-rug to shreds stained the carpet by upsetting the ink over it and having eaten the best part of your manuscript he is about to change its chemical composition when you find him at his work in a year's time the builder has caused the virgin wood to disappear and has covered the fields with streets of houses which show in outward forms of conglomerated bricks and mortar the inner hideousness of his soul true the puppy and the builder had been obliged to use physical machinery to achieve these physical results pitting one set of physical forces and one arrangement of molecules against another still all this continuous construction and destruction has involved continuous psychic effort so that all along the series there will be innumerable points where the physical processes are no longer traceable and the psychic processes come into play but when we try to estimate the proportion of psychic effort to physical result we find we are dealing with incommensurables so many bricks laid so many psychic processes involved in the laying of each we can count the bricks but we cannot count the psychic processes neither can we gauge the intensity of the psychic state at each moment of the process and so far we have only been dealing with one side of the total operation with extension and the displacement and rearrangement of objects in space when we come to time all possible correspondence ceases you can measure the time taken to lay each brick and calculate from it the number of months it will take to complete the entire scheme of the estate but you cannot measure the time of the psychic processes for the simple reason that those processes are more than processes they are syntheses and with them we are brought back once more to the unity of consciousness and we are once more driven to ask number one is there any unity outside our consciousness that corresponds with this unity within it number two if so is that unity also a unity of consciousness or rather is there anything in that unity from which we may infer that where it is there is consciousness number three is there anything in both unities from which we may infer an ultimate unity once more the long round that we have fetched by way of biology and psychology has landed us in ultimate questions of metaphysics End of chapter 3 Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine